All right. Good morning and, and welcome to the Quantum New Mexico Symposium. I'm Ivan Deutsch. I'm the director of the Center for Quantum Information and Control and your MC for the day. Um, today we're here to learn why New Mexico is a quantum state and how the second quantum revolution will spur the high-tech economy that New Mexico helped launch and will lead into the future. The Q&M project aims to build our foundation, build on that foundation and to grow the quantum ecosystem here in New Mexico and realize our potential through partnerships between our universities, national labs and government. So today we're taking the first steps in launching the Q&M Institute, a joint institute between the University of New Mexico and Sandia National Labs in quantum information science. So without further ado, I want to uh, hand over the podium to Susan Seastrom, the Associate Laboratories Director for Advanced Science and Technology and, and Chief Research Officer at Sandia National Labs, and also to Iro Samiloglu, Distinguished Professor and Special Assistant to the Provost for National Laboratory Relations for their welcoming remarks. So Susan, please. <laughs> I'm so glad to be here today. It's amazing to be in a room filled with real people. It, ha it hasn't happened to me that often in the last two years, but I'm also pleased to be able to welcome all of you to this symposium today. I think you're gonna hear about great opportunities in quantum information that will have benefit to New Mexico and impact on quantum information science. I think that there's a lot going on and you'll hear something about that already. No. Okay, that's showing. So, you know, Sandia is intensely interested in quantum information science. You know, our business is national security and uh, quantum is a field that can impact national security greatly. Uh, we, it also is a field where there's a lot of need for foundational, fundamental uh, advances in research and development. And that makes it a really what we think is a sweet spot for Sandia and a sweet spot for New Mexico. Sandia, at Sandia, we think we do our best when we can bring breakthroughs in physics or materials or computing to bear on creating to engineer, through engineering technologies that solve problems in national security. And we do that by investing in key capabilities, by partnering with other labs, with universities and with industry, and by doing what I call team science, right? We do well when we create multidisciplinary teams to solve hard problems. And one of the ways in which we do that is illustrated on the slide behind me. We have identified seven areas that are core capabilities for the future of all missions at Sandia, those we call research foundations, and four of them are particularly relevant for quantum information. You can see in the upper right, uh, material science, uh, nano devices and microsystems, computing and information science, and engineering science. And I would say our, our uh, chair at this session, where did he go? Oh, there you went, Ivan. Um, wrote a paper in 2020 on harnessing uh, the power of the second revolution in quantum information. And he made the point that quantum information is inherently multidisciplinary. To us, that makes it a sweet spot for Sandia. He also made the point that there's a lot of basic science to be done and we have to build on that. And that makes it a sweet spot for this collaboration. Uh, Sandia has some capabilities that we think are differentiating in this regime, and I'll just mention two of the things on this slide. One is the Mesa Fab, which is a silicon fab and a microfab, and which is now a global supplier of ion traps and silicon-based uh, quantum dot devices. And I'll think back to the early 2000s when I was at Los Alamos, and we established there a quantum institute that was sponsored by the physics division and the theory division, and my colleague at that time, Dana Birkeland, had these great ion traps that came from Sandia that she was using, which were on a chip compared to you know, the macroscopic kind of ion traps that were used. And that's the core capability that is playing at Sandia to this day. And then I'll mention the Center for Integrated Nanotechnologies. So a DOE Office of Science user facility jointly managed by Los Alamos and Sandia with sites at both laboratories. 
and they call themselves a community focused on nanoscience integration. And it's through integration of devices into real systems that we can have an impact in quantum science. And there are a few recent innovations that have been done by Sandia researchers on this slide, and I'll just mention a couple things. One is, you know, illustrated on the on the left hand side of the slide, which is a high optical access ion trap, a surface ion trap that uh, has been micro fabricated at Sandia and operates at room temperature. So it allows the kind of access you need to impact the state of the trapped ions in order to make them qubits that can have their state flipped. And then a uh, recent work in one of our LDRD projects has created a reduced footprint atom interferometer for position awareness in GPS in denied environments, has a lot of applications to multiple missions at Sandia. And finally, the quantum systems accelerator, which is one of five centers uh, focused on quantum science funded by the DOE Office of Science, where we partner with Lawrence Berkeley and a number of powerhouse university groups, including UNM. And they're focusing on co-design, which means at the same time thinking about algorithms and architectures to create useful devices is the focus. Uh, so a lot of stuff going on at Sandia already in quantum information. Uh, and I'll just close by mentioning that what you, I'm sure you're going to hear multiple times today, quantum information science is a national strategic priority with a lot of potential to impact New Mexico's economy. Uh, you'll see the quote on this slide from Secretary of Energy Jennifer Granholm, which, who showed a lot of interest in quantum when she was at a virtual tour of Sandia a few weeks ago, and our own Andrew Landau talked to her about this subject. Um, we hope QNM can catalyze and enhance role for New Mexico through strong R&D, quantum energy workforce, and industrial partnerships. So I hope you enjoy the workshop and welcome. And All right, Hannah, uh, I'll need your help in finding slides. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Edel Shamuoglu. I wear several hats here at UNM, uh, but today uh, I'm here as the special assistant to the provost for national lab relations. That's a position that was created in 2017. And the provost at the time thought that it was important to have a point person at UNM to liaise with the national labs. And uh, I think that attests to the importance that UNM places to to its relationship uh, with the labs. Uh, I'd like to welcome Vice President for Research, Ellen Fisher, who's with us, uh, Vice President for Finance, Teresa Costantinidis. I'd like to welcome John Sorrell, Deputy Director for Science, Technology, and Engineering at Los Alamos, and of course, Associate Lab Director, Sue Seastrom from Sandia. I would also like to welcome my colleagues, visitors, and all the students who are joining us today. So what I'd like to talk about is what is UNM's role in QNM, but not only QNM, uh, but rather in the whole uh, e ecosystem of the state of New Mexico? And my response to that is workforce development. UNM's primary role is to educate the next generation of engineers, scientists, technicians, technologists that can go on to support not only the national labs, but also industry in the state. And I think uh, this is a great opportunity to grow the workforce in the quantum ecosystem in New Mexico. 
I'm going to briefly describe some examples of what we're already doing to grow the workforce for the labs. Uh, a couple of years ago, we established a, a Bachelor of Mechanical Engineering program at UNM Los Alamos. There's a tremendous need for mechanical engineers in the state. And by establishing this program up at UNM LA, it gives us an opportunity to grow the workforce that's needed up at Los Alamos. Uh, there's a program that Los Alamos is supporting at UNM called the LANL Accelerator Science and Technology Graduate Undergraduate Research Program that supports students that could then go on and uh, do their uh, advanced research at Los Alamos and potentially join the workforce. And I'd like to highlight this is a tremendous opportunity to grow the QNM workforce for LANL. So there's an opportunity to have a similar a program that could grow the quantum workforce by educating more undergraduate and graduate students at UNM. Of course, uh, we have a special relationship with Sandia uh, National Labs. UNM is one of five Academic Alliance partner institutions, and we have several initiatives that we've been working on with uh, Sandia. For the last several years, we've had a summer institute called NOMAD, uh, which brings together students and postdocs from around the country uh, to come to UNM, stay at the dorms, and um, you know, work on challenges in the area of nonlinear mechanics and dynamics. Of course, since the early 90s, we've had the Advanced Materials Lab, uh, which is down in South Campus, which brings together Sandians, uh, UNM faculty, UNM postdocs, research faculty, and students to collaborate. And, and pre-COVID, every summer, uh, they would host uh, about 30 graduate students from outside of New Mexico who would work and collaborate over the summer. That was an opportunity for UNM to recruit additional graduate students, and it's also is an opportunity to recruit the next generation workforce at Sandia. Uh, we are also collaborating with Sandia and AFRL on a new project on South Campus that we're calling the New Mexico Research Innovation Collaborative. It's basically to amp up what's already going on with AML, but to build a larger building between 150 and 200,000 square feet that will house Sandia, UNM, and then AFRL heard about it and they said, we want to be part of it. So this is a project that it's in its nascent stage uh, we're hoping that it will grow the next generation workforce, not only in material science, in, but also in directed energy, uh, in advanced computing, but also in, in the quantum uh, uh, ecosystem. And recently, uh, we've started a program with Sandia, uh, I would say a year and a half ago, called the START HBCU program. And what this program is, is we're recruiting undergraduate students who are graduating from historically black colleges and universities like Florida A&M, Norfolk State, North Carolina e and and Prairie View A&M. We're recruiting them to UNM to come to graduate school. UNM is offering them in-state tuition, so there's a break on the tuition, and Sandia is hiring them as interns. So they take their classes, they spend 20 hours a week during the academic year at Sandia, and they spend full time in the summer at Sandia. And the first cohort is currently going through the system. I already mentioned this. And we also have the Sandia Women's Action Network, SWAN, which brings together, again, this was pre-COVID, but it did bring together uh, female staff members from Sandia and female faculty from the university uh, periodically to have a um, opportunity to network and socialize. Uh, finally, uh, Sandia is now in discussion with academic advisors in the College of Arts and Sciences, where they're, what they're trying to do is recruit students from non-STEM fields to come to Sandia to work as a technologist, and Sandia would offer uh, the training and the necessary uh, skill set that they would need to be part of the Sandia workforce. And then finally, uh, UNM and Sandia are very close to completing a faculty loan program master agreement. This agreement is similar to our 
uh, already in place, uh, Los Alamos Joint Appointment uh, Master's Agreement, and we're expecting about 30 Sandians to have uh, a presence here on campus as a, uh, we'll call them visiting research professors. We have to use that title because that title is not in the union collective bargaining agreement. And, um, and then we expect about a dozen UNM faculty to have a presence at Sandia. So basically, uh, I'll close by saying that um, UNM is actively working to uh, grow this partnership between Sandia and Los Alamos, and it would benefit not only uh, QNM, but also the entire uh, economic development landscape in the state of New Mexico. And with that, I hope you have a wonderful symposium, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Susan and Ito, for these great perspectives. Um, before we get started, I, I really should take a moment to thank some of the people who helped make this event possible. So first and foremost, the Office of the Vice President for Research here at UNM, and particularly Hannah Torres and, and Gloria Jimenez, who worked really tirelessly behind the scenes to make this happen, so thank you. And thanks also to the New Mexico Consortium for, for their sponsorship. Uh, we also want to take a moment to thank and publicly acknowledge our many important government partners who are joining us in person today. Uh, the QNM Coalition is grateful for your interest and support in this endeavor. In addition to our dozens of esteemed colleagues from Sandia and Los Alamos National Labs, we would like to recognize the following individuals. New Mexico Higher Education Secretary, Stephanie Rodriguez, Jason Jarvis from the US Senator Heinrich's office, Ebony Batty from Congressman, uh, Congresswoman uh, Stanberry's office, Representatives Joy Jarrett and Tara Lujan from the New Mexico House of Representatives, Alex Greenberg from the New Mexico Economic Development Department, Thomas Aaron Reich from the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, Kim Frey and Spencer Olson from our partners at the US Air Force Research Lab, and Chris Grubbs from the National Nuclear Security Administration. So thank you for your support and thank you for being here. And finally, if there are other government officials in the room or online who wish to be recognized and to have their leaders recognized, uh, please raise your hand. We'd like to have you introduce yourselves so uh, we can acknowledge you. So please, uh, you can introduce yourself. Okay, well, thank you. We appreciate you very much. Others, all right. Very good, so thanks uh, all. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our, our keynote speaker. Uh, Senator Martin Heinrich has been a champion for quantum information science and more broadly in support of critical science and technology in the state of New Mexico and in, and in the, the nation. nation. Senator, Senator Heinrich, Heinrich will deliver, deliver the keynote for, for our, our symposium, symposium virtually. virtually. So, so can, can we, we roll, roll the video? video? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to share a few words with you about this exciting new partnership in our state. We have seen so many advances over the last half century in technologies like semiconductors. But all of you surely know better than me that as Moore's law approaches the quantum limit, many of the next technological advances will come from the interdisciplinary field of quantum information science. Understanding and applying the complexities of small-scale quantum systems will unlock new technologies with commercial, industrial, and even national security applications. I couldn't be more excited about New Mexico's potential as a leading hub for this rapidly growing field of research and development. New Mexico is already home to some of the world's leading quantum researchers and cutting-edge facilities. Over the last three decades, 
engineers and scientists at both Los Alamos and Sandia National Labs have made incredible advances in emerging quantum fields. That includes nanotechnology, high-performance computing, and highly precise communication sensing and modeling. The University of New Mexico's Center for Quantum Information and Control is a revolutionary interdisciplinary research center in the higher education space. It brings together leading experts from across UNM science and engineering departments to carry out groundbreaking research. And the brand new Pais building on UNM's main campus offers an incredible home base. Its state-of-the-art labs and classrooms will help STEM students at UNM learn the skills that they'll need for future careers in quantum fields. Our state also has incredible assets in New Mexico State University, New Mexico Tech, our state's community and tribal colleges, and private industry leaders. By establishing the Quantum New Mexico Coalition, we are bringing together all of these resources to build an unrivaled quantum economic ecosystem. The first initiative in this new partnership will be an exciting joint research and education institute between UNM and Sandia. I hope this partnership will strengthen the pipeline between our state's brightest students and quantum careers at our national labs. I want to do all I can to support the growth of New Mexico's quantum economy. I want to help New Mexicans identify and compete for federal funding opportunities and private capital investment. I am supporting the education and training of our state's workforce so New Mexicans can prepare for high quality jobs in quantum fields. And I'm working with partners to build a strong infrastructure that will allow us to move innovative quantum technologies out of the laboratory and into the factory. I want our state to become the premier center for manufacturing the innovative technologies that will be the fruits of all the research and engineering that is already underway at our labs and our universities. This new Quantum New Mexico partnership will be an essential ingredient in helping good ideas that get their start in New Mexico from research and development all the way through commercialization and larger scale manufacturing. With all our state's bright minds, scientific expertise and proven experience, New Mexico is so well positioned for the opportunities in quantum fields. If we can all work together and bring all of our resources to bear, I am confident that we can make New Mexico the world's best place for quantum science. You can count on me to be your enthusiastic partner in this effort. Thank you. Probably the first time in history of a meeting that I've been at where ahead of schedule, but we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll get going here. So let's see. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to switch out the laptop because I never trust if you've got a Mac working on a Windows machine. So let me get this together. Let's see. Glad we had extra ten minutes. It was working yesterday. Yeah. If not, we can go with the other. No, it's fine. Why don't we use the this control? Let's try with the other computer. It's, it's okay. 
You have it on there? It is. Okay. Let's find the find the it's that one. We'll give folks a moment to get some coffee. We'll get started in just a minute or two.
All right, all. Let's, uh, if everyone can, uh, if everyone can take their seats again, we can uh, get started. All right. All right. Welcome back, everybody. So uh, our next session is a discussion of why is New Mexico a quantum state? And we'll uh, begin uh, here uh, with a discussion of quantum information science at the University of New Mexico. Those of you who came in late, I'm Ivan Deutsch. I'm the director for the Center for Quantum Information and Control, which we call CQIC. And uh, I'm also a, a Regents Professor of Physics and Astronomy. And, and since I am a professor, we need a little to have a little test to begin. You ready? Uh, anybody have a guess? Oh, that was good. You ruined the joke. What about this one? Quiz show, right. Now, this one is way easier. No one ever gets the first one. Uh, <laughs> But so why why is though why is this much easier to guess than this one? And this one doesn't have a lot of information in it. This one just has vowels, and vowels are in every word. And you know, a Q and a Z that's a lot of information that you're getting. So this is the first lesson for the day. What is information? Information is about you. It's about what you know and what you don't know. We know something about the English language, the frequency with which letters appear, and we use that prior information in the way in which we make judgments about the world and the way we process data and make predictions. And we do so logically, right? I mean, hopefully, this is the Google image of what logic is. It's got the square root of one, two, three in it and other stuff. Um, but quantum mechanics is illogical. Um, quantum mechanics has within it paradoxes that make no sense to us in our everyday lives. There's paradoxes that you might have heard about, the idea of Schrodinger's cat, which can be both alive and dead at the same time, and quantum entanglement, in which particles that are separated at distinct parts of the galaxy, in some sense, know about each other's presence, and there's what Einstein called spooky action at a distance. Um, so what, what, let's talk a little bit more about this. What, how is quantum mechanics illogical? Here's a, a little bit of a, what, we, what we call a Gedanken experiment, a thought experiment. Uh, so here I have a, um, a little source, the kind that's produced uh, at Sandia National Labs and Los Alamos National Labs and, and at the Center for High Tectonic Materials that produce single uh, photon sources. And that single photon, that particle of light, is incident on a what we call a half-silvered mirror, a, a beam splitter. And the photon, it's like a, uh, it can flip a coin. The, pho the photon can transmit through that beam splitter and hit that detector with half 50% uh, probability, or you flip the coin and it goes there. It only goes to one detector or the other, right? It's like flipping a coin. Okay, but what happens if I do the following thing? I have this uh, beam splitter and I bounce it off a mirror where it hits another beam splitter. Okay, that's one way the photon could go. But suppose the photon goes the other way. Okay, those are two possible paths. Path one, and path you didn't think you were going to get a physics lesson, but you are. All right. So those are the two paths the photon could go. So now I ask you, here's your test. Which detector is going to go click, A or B? I mean, you know, that's a 50-50 beam splitter. There's a chance the photon went this way. And if it goes that way, it's a half-half chance it goes to A or B. 
or it might go path two, and then there's a 50-50 chance it would go this way or that way, right? So it's a 50-50 chance, once again. Wrong. It's totally illogical. It makes no sense. 100% of the time, the photon goes that way, and 0% of the time, it goes B, if I align that interferometer exactly right. And this is the kind of new physics that just makes no sense that we want to harness. This is what's called quantum interference, and quantum events defy logic. And the field of quantum information science uh, is an interdisciplinary field that, as Susan Seastrom mentioned, that brings together many different traditional disciplines, physics, engineering, mathematics, chemistry, computer science, uh, to meld the way in which we can harness that new kind of logic, that quantum logic, to do things that are just impossible if the world obeyed the classical rules of logic. And you can, this is what's called the second quantum revolution. You can go to this website from the National Institute of Standards Technology, which tells us a lot more about it. So we talked about information, information processing. We're all familiar with this. Uh, we use it now all the time in our daily lives to communicate, uh, over Zoom, the hello people in Zoom land, uh, to uh, you know, do commerce. Uh, we better hope that our credit cards are not being uh, cracked and stolen, so we have to encrypt them in some way. And we use computers uh, to do things. You know, those of us who are our are, are, uh, scientists are doing mathematical calculations. We're all doing Google searches. We hope the weather's predicted. And this is all based on technology that we would call part of the first quantum revolution. Transistors, uh, uh, lasers, uh, things that involve quantum mechanics, but don't fully harness the full power of what we know quantum mechanics is capable of. And the pillars of quantum information science are to move that forward, to think about ways in which we can make computers, quantum computers, we can communicate with uh, based on the laws of quantum mechanics, and in addition, do other kinds of tasks like sensing the most tiny signals like gravity waves or tiny biological signals. And this allows us to think about new technologies and also it's a feedback loop into the effect and what we learn about the universe itself. Basic science and technology are a continuous conversation, and we need to think about both at the same time. So here are some of the potential impacts uh, of, of quantum information science. We mentioned quantum computation. Quantum computation has the potential to radically speed up algorithms for things like chemical development or drug discovery, optimizing things like traffic patterns and forecasting climate. These are the kinds of things that there is potential in communication. Communication, cybersecurity. I mentioned making sure your, your credit card is safe. Uh, if we had a quantum computer, forget it. Your quantum computer, uh, your credit cards, they would be ours because we could be able to break the codes instantly. And we need to create new ones. In fact, we can make ones that are unbreakable by the laws of physics themselves uh, that would keep uh, our credit cards and other secrets safe. And I mentioned quantum sensing, an important idea that also impacts medicine and biology in creating new kinds of microscopes that, that act at the, at the quantum limit. New Mexico really is part of this important story of the development of this exciting new field. And New Mexico, through its foundation, what we'll hear about today, really has the potential to train and develop not only these technologies and the science, but also the workforce that uh, Edel mentioned in his welcoming remarks. So let me just say a few words about UNM's long history in this field. 
we really owe a debt of gratitude to Carl Caves, who is a uh, dis distinguished uh, emeritus professor who came to UNM and established the Information Physics Group in 1992. Carl is a member of the National Academy, and I came to UNM because Carl was here and helped to launch our, uh, our program. Um, the Center for Quantum Information Control was established in 2009 and is now one of two, actually three NSF funded focus research hub in theoretical physics uh, with a number of faculty, postdocs and students. And we live within a very rich ecosystem. Uh, as I said, it's a multidisciplinary effort involving multiple departments, physics, electrical and computer engineering, chemistry and chemical biology and computer science. And CQIC is one amongst many centers that are involved in this endeavor at the University of New Mexico, including the Center for High Technology Materials and uh, the Center for Advanced Computing uh, Research Computing. And of course, the national laboratories, which play a very important role. Uh, Los Alamos really was critical in launching the uh, second quantum revolution. We'll hear from John Sorrell, as well as uh, Sandia National Labs and the Air Force Research Laboratories are is moving in this direction. And we're looking forward to growing that partnership as well. Um, as was also earlier mentioned, we are part of a growing national ecosystem. Uh, New Mexico plays an important role we at CQIC are part of NSF's program uh, as a focused research hub. We are the nation's quantum information theory hub uh, for, for the NSF. Um, we are part of two additional centers that were launched via the National Quantum Initiative Act of 2018, one of NSF's Quantum Leap Challenge Institutes called QSense, and one of five large Department of Energy quantum information science centers led by Sandia National Labs and Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, the Quantum Systems Accelerator. Um, and the work we do outreaches as well to the community. Uh, the Southwest Quantum Information Technology uh, Workshop, Squint, is, is in its uh, now, oh, I don't know, 25 year, uh, it's, uh, it is led by my colleague, uh, Professor Akimasa Miyake. QReach reaches out to undergraduates across the state of New Mexico. Uh, Los Alamos has one of the premier summer schools in quantum computing. And we are also, through the efforts led by Sandia, uh, having outreach to high school teachers and high school students. Uh, through a new effort called QCAMP. But I, I want to say, our, our, really, our history goes very deep. Those of you who are in the audience who have learned the subject of quantum computing and quantum information probably learned it from this Bible, which is known as Mike and Ike. Does anybody know who Mike Nielsen and, and, and Ike Chuang are? They did their education here in New Mexico. Uh, Mike Nielsen was a PhD in physics uh, in, in the department here in UNM, and Ike Chuang was a postdoc, a director's funded postdoc at Los Alamos, and they met here in New Mexico in 1998, and that's what spurred this. Many people don't know that Mike and Ike was written here in New Mexico. Um, and the training that we do, educating the next generation of, of leaders has happened. And we'll hear in an alumni uh, um, forum uh, in, the, in the next session uh, from some of our uh, alumni who are now today's leaders in the field amongst a, um, an esteemed group of, I'd say, over 50 PhDs that we produce in this area uh, and other, in other degrees as well. And I just want to highlight, in addition, the work that uh, is going into the launching of the new institute builds on a foundation of decades of collaboration between the labs, uh, both Sandia and Los Alamos and, and UNM. Here's a, a, a snapshot of some of the students, some of whom 
have already graduated. These folks at the, at the lower row are currently students. I want to just call out one example. Adrian Orozco was actually an undergraduate at UNM. He's a first generation college graduate uh, and then went on to uh, do his uh, PhD in physics. He just defended uh, uh, last month and uh, did his research uh, at Sandia National Labs. So next steps. The Q&M project, that's really what we're here to talk about today. New Mexico is a quantum state. Um, doesn't mean we're both alive and dead at the same time, but uh, uh, it does mean that we have this very strong foundation and it, upon that foundation that we're gonna build something really great. So what are some of the ingredients of this project? The first ingredient that we're gonna hear about today uh, is the launching of the QNM Institute, QNMI. And this uh, is a joint research and education institute. Uh, and I should say, as, as uh, Ellen Fisher, the, the vice president for research, likes to say, and I agree wholeheartedly, research is education. The way in which we, part of the way in which we educate uh, the workforce of the future is through their hands on experience as researchers through um, the kind of apprenticeship training that we deeply give to our students. And I'm very proud to see my students here in the audience listening to this uh, presentation. So workforce development is, is critical and we do that through research, education is, is are intimately related. Um, and the basic research we do will expand and leverage the resources that we have in the multiple centers that we already have, like the QSA, like the QSC, uh, the Quantum Science uh, uh, Center at uh, Los Alamos and Oak Ridge National Labs. And also through building industry partnerships. Economic development is another very important part of the story. So that really brings me to my final slide here uh, about the broader QM coalition. The QNM coalition is, to, is our effort to try to create and expand the quantum ecosystem across the state of New Mexico to build upon the foundation of basic research that has been done over 30 years here in New Mexico in quantum information science and before, of course, to grow the quantum ecosystem, including industry and broadening the activities including our other universities, particularly the other research universities in New Mexico, New Mexico State, New Mexico Tech, as well as community colleges and tribal university colleges as well, such as Navajo Tech. And I should just finally mention that this whole enterprise of quantum information science does not exist in the vacuum. It cannot. We have to build the IT infrastructure and expand it throughout, build the scaffolding that we need for our quantum future. Things like expanded broadband, cloud computing, advanced manufacturing materials, all of these things are gonna be important and part of what we need to achieve here to make the, the Quantum Mexico project succeed. So I think I will conclude there and thank you for your attention. We'll take questions, I think, at the end after all speakers uh, have had their turn. And I thank you for your attention. All right. You're up, John. I'll let you know. Good choice. Great, thank you. 
So good morning, everybody. Um, my name is John Sarau. I am the Deputy Director for Science, Technology, and Engineering at Los Alamos. I'm delighted to be here, both with our partners at UNM and Sandia, um, and also the broader New Mexico community in quantum, um, certainly spanning all the other research institutions and other stakeholders in the state, um, as Ivan just mentioned. And so what I want to do is say a bit about Los Alamos' role in this space. And I guess I want to purposefully misuse Ivan's framing of second quantum revolution. So I'm going to put more of an arc of time on it and talk about past, present, and future. But hopefully the punchline will be, even though I'm misusing his framing, I will actually come to the same conclusion and make the same point. And that's part of the objective. And so I want to put an arc of time on that. And, and I'll talk firstly about sort of, you know, really ancient history, um, sort of what I'll call the first quantum renaissance, and then come to today and make similar points. And so in that space, the, the place that I want to start is really how deep the origins of quantum matter are in the existence of Los Alamos and Sandia. Um, and, and so I'll try to make the point for you, which is actually quite personal for me in my own research, that, that quantum matter really is central to nuclear weapons and the core missions of Sandia and Los Alamos. And so if you go back to the very earliest days of the Manhattan Project, one of the challenges we had is that we needed to use plutonium. Um, and it turns out that plutonium in sort of its native form kind of behaves like cast iron. And if you want to actually make parts out of it and machine it, cast iron is a pretty crummy material to work with. And it turns out that if you add very, very small amounts of gallium to plutonium, you can turn it then from behaving like cast iron to behaving like aluminum. Um, and it turns out that, that that metallurgical behavior, which seems totally unrelated to anything we're talking about today, is actually a quantum effect. Um, and that, 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 that alloying effect, which led to sort of understanding the plutonium electronic structure, literally motivated decades of work at Los Alamos focused on magnetism and superconductivity. Um, and my own little personal contribution to this space is, is the crystal that you're seeing in the picture. And actually, my, finger, my fingers are probably on the other end of those tweezers. It turns out that plutonium is actually a superconductor. And it actually superconducts at remarkably high temperatures. And so that connectivity from the metallurgy of plutonium and Manhattan Project really motivated decades and decades of research at Los Alamos and across the broader community. Same song, different verse. If you pivot from Manhattan Project to questions like the hydrogen bomb and how that played out, um, the picture on the upper right um, is Mike, uh, new, uh, the first sort of hydrogen bomb test. Um, that has direct causal links to Los Alamos's expertise in cryogenics and superfluidity. So we have no particular claim to the picture on the lower right, which is the discovery of superfluidity in helium-3 made at Cornell. But, but again, we have a decadal history in understanding superfluidity driven by our interest in, in tritium and the hydrogen bomb. And so the, the point is sort of not to give you sort of a nuclear weapons 101 lecture, but to draw that arc of time from literally the earliest days of Los Alamos through to the present. And, and as Susan, I think, nicely articulated in Sandia's framing of core capabilities, the frontiers of superconductivity and superfluidity for us, which are intrinsically quantum phenomena, really date to our founding and our core mission. The same is certainly true in computing. Um, and so as Ivan highlighted some of sort of the thought leaders that have origins in New Mexico, um, Richard Feynman is certainly another one of those, one of those thought leaders. And, and you know, while he, some of his views may be a bit dated and, and out of date these days, he was certainly prescient in these fields. So Los Alamos has recognized the need to be a leader in computing again since its earliest days. Um, and you see Nick Metropolis in the upper of the two pictures. And, and it has already been noted, one of the key features there is not only understanding and shaping what the frontiers of hardware are, but also understanding the frontiers of software and algorithms and how those things work together. Um, and that was a feature of Los Alamos, again, back in the earliest days as, as evidenced by sort of the grayness of the black and white picture, um, all the way to things like we've done recently in this space, sort of playing around with this, with this quantum annealing machine that D-Way was putting out. And I think one of the debates that people asked when we sort of made that play was to say, well, is it really a quantum computer or isn't it? And our point was, it doesn't really matter. It's kind of a weird device that seems to rely on quantum 
Can you do something with it to make that play out? And so that history has colored our thinking and computing, again, literally since the very beginning and sort of our prehistory. Um, and certainly some of the comments that Feynman made over the decades from sort of, you know, back in the 50s when he spent time at Los Alamos with the Manhattan Project um, to the picture where you can see the Los Alamos logo where he actually came to the lab in the early 80s around our 40th birthday um, and said there was something to do. And so or at least through the historical lens, that was one of the origins of this path to a first quantum renaissance. So, I, you know, I, I, to be fair, in this slide, I need to give credit to Susan, because I think Susan is sort of the architect of much of this thinking, um, which she was at Los Alamos some time ago, and she and I have worked in this topic um, quite significantly together for quite a number of years. And so what I'll highlight for you firstly is in the middle of the slide, this issue of Los Alamos science, which you can actually still find on the internet today, and I include the URL in the bottom of the slide and encourage you to take a look, um, was one of the attempts championed by this quantum institute that Susan described to sort of inventory what we Los Alamos were doing and others were doing sort of circa 2000. Um, it feels like just yesterday, um, it's scary to admit that we've worked on this together for more than 20 years, and but that's all good. Um, and, and so in addition to sort of highlighting that sort of compendium of stuff and, and certainly a piece of evidence that we Los Alamos have been leaders in that space, um, the other thing that I wanted to note is, is one thing that's highlighted in this particular issue is the fact that Los Alamos was engaged in essentially all of the relevant quantum technologies, at least of the day in that era. Um, one of the challenges I would say we had was because in, the, in, the, in sort of the historical sense of first renaissance or first revolution, arguably we were ahead of our time. And so it was challenging for us to sustain all those capabilities across all those diverse quantum technologies. And, and we're frankly less active in those spaces today than we were 20 years ago. Um, I think the strength for us is that's allowed us to be relatively technology agnostic and have, you know, have efforts in all of these areas, but not at the same depth as, for example, Susan highlighted in the work at Sandia on ion traps. And as Susan highlighted, one of the great partnerships that we formed then was Los Alamos scientists saying, why should we go reinvent the wheel? Better to go partner with our colleagues at Sandia. And that's led to sort of a more than 20 year collaboration in that space. One of the things that's not highlighted in the particular images I'm showing you here um, is the very long and foundational work that Los Alamos has played a role in both in sort of the fundamental theory of quantum information, some of sort of the paradoxes that Ivan highlighted um, that have played out for a very long time and also inform our efforts in quantum algorithms and quantum simulation. So, so there was a relative sort of renaissance sort of circa 20 years ago. Um, and I think the thing that's really exciting about today is we're seeing that, that same renaissance playing out again um, with significant sort of you know, financial investment, which is necessary but not sufficient, and also significant intellectual investment is evidenced by the number of people that are present at events like this. And so that makes that pretty exciting. And so what I wanna to touch on in sort of the last piece of the talk are some of the things that we're active in today, a number of which you've already seen, which I think are foundational both to achieving the second quantum renaissance um, and also making Los Alamos or making New Mexico um, a quantum state. And I'll sort of, I'll refactor that at the end to give us all a challenge. So you've already heard several times about SENT, um, and as Susan highlighted, SENT is very much a joint partnership between Los Alamos and Sandia and has physical locations both here in Albuquerque and in New Mexico and in Los Alamos. Um, I purposely make this a busy slide, not because I'm gonna talk about it, but the point that I wanna make is SENT is actually a user facility. So yes, many Los Alamos scientists, many Sandia scientists use SENT every day, um, including to advance the frontiers of quantum science, um, but SENT is a you know, free for service, free for use, open user facility. So anybody, anybody who's a citizen of New Mexico, anybody who's a citizen of the country or the world can come to SENT and access all the capabilities that are detailed in the, in the part of the slide. And that's, that's part of the opportunity for we New Mexico to be a quantum state to say we are the host, both of these tools and of the intellectual leadership to advance the frontiers of quantum for anyone who wants to come work with us. And so that's a really exciting opportunity that's very much a joint effort between us and Sandia. 
You've heard several times about the Quantum Accelerator, which is an exciting partnership funded by the Office of Science between Sandia and Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Um, this is a space where we Los Alamos chose a slightly different path. We chose to partner with Oak Ridge and other colleagues um, in what's called the Quantum Science Center. And I think what's exciting about that is we in New Mexico are playing leadership roles in two of the five quantum centers. Um, and the fact that sometimes, like in the previous example, we can be intimately coupled and completely hand in hand. And in other instances like this, we can be going down different paths and there's broader room for collaboration for everybody um, is really important. Um, and one of the things we're focused on in, in the Quantum Science Center, and one of the ways that Los Alamos is playing a leadership role, is our work in leading the quantum algorithms and quantum simulation thrust of QSC. And so I think keeping in mind that, yes, if we're going to be successful, we need to not only realize quantum technologies and translate that to practice, but the role that algorithms and simulations play really is very much essential. The third piece I'll touch on um, is an effort called QUAINT, the Quantum Accelerated Internet Testbed. Um, and I won't talk about that in particular detail other than to make the specific point that in addition to it being an exciting effort that also includes partners, it actually builds on work we've done that's actually deployed quantum technologies to the grid. Um, and so part of success needs to be not only doing world leading research because it's really exciting, and it's important to broader mission challenges. But if you're gonna be successful, you've got to translate these things to practice. And so the fact that you can actually take quantum technology, which is conf as confusing and counterintuitive as Ivan quite nicely explained, and say, yet we're gonna use that on the electric grid for cyber considerations um, is really important. It also ups the challenge in how we work through as a community the kind of partnering that's necessary with various industrial entities to make that happen. And so that, that piece of the quantum economy, I think, is important. Um, and you'll hear about that tomorrow from colleagues, both from Sandia and Los Alamos and other players in the region. Not forgetting that translation piece is a really important part of success. The last piece I'll touch on is, is the workforce piece um, that a number of people have already talked about. I um, appreciate Ivan's very complimentary comments about our quantum summer school. Um, one of the points that I'll make is the demand signal. So what you're seeing in the middle of the slide is the number of students who have applied to our quantum summer school year over year. Um, so you see it started off kind of small, like all things do, like this new collaboration, things are modest. But when you've got the right things, things succeed and grow exponentially. So this year we had of order 450 students who applied for the 25 slots in our quantum summer school. So that says we're doing something right. One of the things we're struggling with is how do you make it bigger? Because you could say, well, look, John, 400 people applied. Why don't you take them all? The thing we're focused on is actually doing that well. And we're trying to figure out, can we go from 25 to 30 or 40? It can't scale and maintain that quality. So, so there clearly is a set of, of students who are interested in this space how we all work together to deliver high quality opportunities is really important. Um, you'll hear more about the quantum summer school from, from my colleague, Luca Cincio tomorrow. So look forward to hearing more about that. The other thing I'll highlight is maybe a silver lining if we can find it in, in sort of the pandemic that we're still not quite out of. And so I'm showing you on the left of the slide, um, you know, basically our compilation of all the videos of all the talks that played out in, in last year's quantum summer school, um, because of course we had to do a virtual. Um, not nearly as exciting as doing it face to face, but the great news is we actually have this archive. Um, you can't possibly read all the titles of all the talks on this slide, um, but you can surely recognize the UNM logo in several places. So that's another place where the partnership really is quite robust between us and our colleagues at UNM in that space. Um, so that's a bit of sort of prehistory. Um, the first quantum renaissance and a set of the things that we at Los Alamos are doing, including with colleagues to enable the current quantum renaissance and the second quantum revolution. Um, and so to, to sort of close, what I want to do is one, you know, remind you and remind us how important partnerships is. So certainly the work we do with UNM and Sandia is really important to us. Certainly all of the stakeholders in the state are important um, and also engaging with a variety of other 
broader societies, broader organizations, both in terms of setting standards um, and also in fostering the economy. Um, and so I want to sort of correct Ivan a little bit and take the senator at his challenge and say maybe the objective is not that New Mexico should be a quantum state, because that's maybe too easy to achieve. Maybe the challenge is to make New Mexico the quantum state. And so working together, I think there is a credible opportunity for us to go from A to V, and we at Los Alamos would be excited to play a role in that, in that evolution to make New Mexico the quantum state. And with that, I'll stop and thank you all for your attention. And I think I'll turn it over to Rick. No, I thought it was on your computer. It, yes, but it's also, I thought that you're not being able to try this. Oh, maybe this. We could, we could talk to you. Let's give it a shot. Good. Excellent. Hmm. Excellent. Good. Okay. Thank you all. Um, I'm Rick Muller. Um, I'm from Sandia National Laboratories. I'm the senior manager of the group at Sandia where a lot of the experimental uh, quantum information science uh, research takes place. Um, and I also help coordinate the, the quantum portfolio across the laboratory. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about the third part of the New Mexico is a quantum state, uh, which has to do with uh, Sandia's history here. Um, so, so, so one of the reasons that quantum in the early days appealed to places like Los Alamos and Sandia National Laboratories um, is that it has many applications um, to areas that are important to uh, either national or economic security. Um, and, and other people uh, this morning have already mentioned many of these. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll cite um, uh, what got me involved in this initially um, as a chemist and a material scientist, uh, which was its ability to do uh, nearly exact calculations in chemistry and material science um, uh, much faster than you can do using uh, classical um, uh, resources. Uh, but, but, but it has many other applications as well. So, so this was a, 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 a fertile area, I think, for uh, national lab engagement. Am I not being picked up? Okay. Um, and we can, how visible are these names? Uh, very small. Um, so, so we can similarly look at um, a, 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 a timeline of, of um, how uh, research breakthroughs drove the response uh, for, for government. So, you know, this is the, um, the, the simulating physics with computers that, that John mentioned a few minutes ago that uh, Richard Feynman came up with um, uh, in the 90s um, when Los Alamos was, was already getting involved. Um, we had initial work showing that the, that the algorithms behind quantum computation could do something that classical computers couldn't. So um, uh, uh, David Deutsch, uh, and Umesh Vaisarani uh, played important roles in that. Um, and of course, Peter Shore showed that you could do um, um, phase estimation and error correction um, within a year of each other. Um, and, um, and, and many investments, both in industry and government, followed from that. Uh, what, this, what this timeline uh, misses is, of course, the, the, the exponential uh, nature of that, where if we were really to be putting uh, marks on this timeline, it would be much too crowded to to read toward the end of it. Um, this is a field that has um, really taken off over the last uh, certainly ten years, five years. Um, and and Sandia has a a uh, similarly rich timeline. Um, 
Uh, we, we were not involved um, as early as Carl and Ivan were at UNM or uh, the team at Los Alamos was. Uh, but, but very early on, we recognized that many of the technologies uh, that we were developing there and many of the infrastructure investments we had at, at Sandia um, were, were well posed to, um, to, to respond to those. And, and I'm going to be uh, touching on a few of those to kind of talk about uh, the capabilities that we have at Sandia um, and, and how, we, how we grew them here. Um, and, and as has been mentioned, one of our first uh, endeavors into this was uh, building ion traps. Um, so, so Sandia um, does the microelectronics, as Susan mentioned, for the nuclear weapon stockpile, which means that we have two uh, foundries at the lab uh, in the MESA organization, which is where I work. Um, and at the time, uh, MESA had a, um, a, a microfabrication capability that was being used to do ion mobility spectroscopy, which is when you get wanded at the airport to test for, uh, for our chemicals, they then put that in a device called an ion mobility spectrometer, and that helps identify whether it's a bad chemical or not. Um, and so Sandia was was already making those, and um, and in and, and in the early days, uh, particularly Matt Blaine and Chris Tigas uh, recognized that that same technology could be used to develop a new type of ion trap, these 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 surface ion traps uh, that could be made in a MEMS facility and uh, made on a single chip uh, that could be um, um, made uniformly and distributed widely. Um, and so we got uh, early funding from IARPA. Uh, I think it was one of the first projects that they funded largely um, uh, from, from the MQCO and, and the logic program to create what, what was called the Ion Trap Foundry. Um, and the Ion Trap Foundry was, was made to support IARPA programs, but also to support researchers around the world in, um, in Ion Trap quantum computing. Um, and um, and and so there are that's been just a huge success for us and for the overall field um and and that was a, an important kind of early step that we've done in that um and and some people that are now uh making commercial companies around this um have used our traps and plan to use our traps in the future as well um, so so i and q in in particular um the next stage at sandia was um was a number of uh, grand challenge uh, laboratory directed research and development um, projects that we had at the laboratory and so so sandia's internal or national labs internal research and development is is called laboratory directed research and development um, and in sandia they come in kind of two sizes uh, we have the the regular ones and then a larger amount um, that are up to and sometimes a little bit more than uh, five million dollars a year, uh, which are called the grand challenges. Um, and so we had a sequence of four grand grand challenges that really developed key technologies. Uh, the Quist project uh, was led by Malcolm Carroll, um, and that was developing uh, silicon based uh, quantum dot devices and donor devices, um, uh, but also developed some of our very early work in understanding architecture um, and, and how the layout of quantum devices uh, affects what types of circuits you can do efficiently with those. Uh, that was followed by a project called Aquarius that Andrew Landall led, um, and that was looking at specific as aspects of the adiabatic architecture, uh, but also developed really important key technologies for us, um, among them our, um, our atomically precise lithography capability. So that's um, doing um, silicon lithography using a, a, a scanning tip instead of using uh, photolithography. Um, as well as developing our neutral atom quantum computing capabilities um, uh, that's also um, allowed us to stand up a neutral atom based quantum, quantum sensing capability as well. Uh, Ryan Camacho led uh, the next project, uh, which is called Secant QKD, and that was looking at miniaturizing quantum key distribution devices and kind of bringing it from optical table scales down on, onto single chips. Um, and that remains important to the work we do today um, around quantum networking um, and quantum communications. 
And then finally, uh, we just had a project finish a year ago that Peter Schwent, who I think I saw in the audience, uh, led called Sigma, which was the Strategic Inertial Guidance with Matter Waves uh, project. You can see we put a lot of work into uh, uh, acronyms at, at, at Sandia. Um, that was that was looking at developing um, uh, quantum devices that could be used for positional sensing in, let's say, GPS denied environments. Um, and so, um, so, so we really developed a very broad uh, set of set of of, of capabilities, um, and and more to the point, we developed um, a really deep bench of quantum researchers at this. Um, we were we were lucky to be involved in quantum before um, the, 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 the recent quantum hype that's happened over the last five years, let's say. Um, and, and, and we were able just to hire, you know, the best people that I've ever worked with um, uh, at, at the laboratory. Um, and, um, and, and that's still the case here. Um, so, so other capabilities that we've developed along the way, um, we've, we've developed a lot of capabilities that let us use uh, computer modeling and simulation to um, both design, um, to understand, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, characterize, and to kind of predict the performance of quantum circuits in, in various uh, areas here. So, um, you know, among them, I've got pretty pictures of uh, being able to uh, form um, uh, silicon-based quantum 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 devices uh, to 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 understand how the layouts of of the of the actual silicon device changes uh, the quantum uh, uh, the quantum response of of, of those devices uh, and and similarly some of the work going on at the quantum performance laboratory in benchmarking uh, commercial quantum quantum processors here um, which is much more challenging than uh, looking at, at classical computing capabilities uh, because of course quantum quantum devices make far more errors than classical computing devices do um, one of the things that's been recently very exciting uh, has been the department of energy's uh, office of science um, uh, investments in 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 quantum information science um, and um, and and we've been uh, the the beneficiary of of some of that funding. Uh, so Sandia hosts the quantum scientific computing open user test bed, uh, Q Scout. Uh, again, we spent a lot of time on acronyms. Um, I think many of these came from Andrew actually, um, but um, but but Q Scout is an open user facility. Um, so, so like uh, what John said around Sint, uh, where people can apply to run on a very near term, a very early term uh, quantum quantum computing device based around our trapped ion quantum computing capabilities. Um, so, so Q Scout doesn't offer the same resources that you can get, let's say, from the IBM Quantum Experience right now. What 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 Q Scout provides that is unique. Um, is is very low level access to those resources. So so Q Scout gives you the ability to change the pulses um, and change the gate structure and the layout and and the scheduling. Uh, and the goal of that device is to offer people in remote laboratories as 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 close to the same experimental capabilities that you would have if you were actually working in the laboratory um, so you can really understand not only what a quantum computer can do but but why it might have not succeeded along the way and how you can make it better um, and i'll just point out that um, a year ago uh, or a few months ago uh, we were notified that we were uh, a rnd 100 award winner uh, from r d magazine uh, for for that early access to the Q Scout uh, capabilities there, and then many people have um, noted the various NQI centers that exist in the state of New Mexico. Uh, the one that Sandia co-leads with Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories is called the Quantum Systems Accelerator. Um, we've got a, a really um, remarkable set of, of of partners that we work with on this, including the University of New Mexico, um, and this gives us um, an important a uh, set of research projects to to understand how we can move quantum computing from from where it is today uh, in the future and, and what uh, technical uh, innovations are going to be required uh, to make such a move. 
and then finally, um, so, so as I hope I've shown, Sandia has developed a variety of different quantum quantum devices. Um, something that is that is key to Sandia's um, path forward, uh, both just from a from 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 my organization's point of view. Again, I'm in the in the Mesa facility, the uh, microelectronics engineering science and applications facility there, where we have the the, the silicon and and the uh, compound semiconductor foundries, um, um, but also in its in its in its in its quantum program is is making those devices work together. Uh, so we want to understand how to not just uh, make a quantum computing device, but then understand how we can uh, make multiple devices that might be integrated together uh, or might work with with other types of quantum devices or even classical devices like sensors or communications devices. Um, but but the integration vision, I think, extends beyond just the types of devices we make uh, to to the types of people that we want to be able to work with uh, and the kind of environment that we want to be able to build in the state of New Mexico uh, and in other places where we work. Um, so um, so so um, with that, I'll conclude. I think uh, we're going to open it to questions in a moment. Um, but um, but I'll conclude by just thanking you for um, for for coming uh, for 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 listening to what we can do uh, in in quantum New Mexico. Um, and I look forward to talking to you and answering any questions you have. So thank you. Do you want to see? I think we, I welcome John back to the podium, and I think uh, we'll take questions both from the audience and, and if there are any also online, I guess we may ask them. So um, please, uh, if you have questions, raise your hand. We do have online questions. All right, go. We'll start there. Of course, that's always a, a question, an important question. Technology is powerful, and it's up to us and, and the leaders to, to ensure that you know uh, technology is used for the better benefit of all society. Um, you know, I think that's a little bit above my pay grade as, as a professor of physics and astronomy. But it, indeed, we do think about this to ensure that. Um, you know what we're doing uh, is is ways that we can protect our secrets, not to invade invade people's privacy and to to uh, in any way you know make technology that will be harmful to society. So I don't know if the others want to weigh in on on ways in which what well, some of the what are some of the threats we might have relative to quantum technologies. Yeah, no. So happy to take that one. Certainly, good question. I mean, I think. Everything that Sandia does, everything that Los Alamos does, recognizes that the, I mean, there is no domain of science and technology that's not potentially dual use. So, so the wrong thing we could do is go behind our fences, do all this stuff only in a national security lens and not talk to anybody. Um, at the surface, that might seem to be the safer thing to do. It's frankly the dumbest thing you could do. So what we've got to do is be broadly engaged the broader community, both you know, within the state for events like this, with the broader international community. Because if we're, if we're playing a role in being thought leaders, then we can understand where the opportunities are and where the risks lie, where we can be partnering broadly, we can be situationally aware, and we can help steer things, as Ivan says, towards the right purposes and avoid the traps that we might walk into or that people who are less friendly with us might try to exploit. So I think it's, it's these, these venues are exactly how we manage that challenge. And it's something we think about every single day. Yeah, quantum, quantum, quantum New Mexico gives us the opportunity to, to develop these technologies uh, publicly with, with a lot of partners um, and, and is, is one excellent way to ensure that these things do develop in the public interest. Yes. 
Sure. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I we'll repeat, all have to repeat the question. Yeah. So the, the question is how, how, what quantum information science can impact the state's economy, uh, and and bring these ideas to uh, economic growth. Uh, and I think there is. We already see this uh, happening. There is a lot of investment going on at all levels, uh, in the. Um, in government investment, as well as in the private sector. In the private sector, it's investment at the levels of big tech, places like Google, Microsoft, uh, IBM, uh, places like Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman, the, the, and, and what we sometimes call the military industrial complex, as well as, as startups and entrepreneurship. Uh, and what we believe, and I agree wholeheartedly with John's challenge, New Mexico is the quantum state. One of the things that uh, we communicate here is we have both the intellectual capital as well as the resources to grow entrepreneurship, to attract big companies, to have uh, a presence here in the state of New Mexico to, for Google and, and others to bring uh, their enterprise to New Mexico for us to um, as well grow entrepreneurship. And in addition, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a broader enterprise than just the, the high tech future of quantum information. It's also about more traditional uh, aspects of technology, like improving broadband across our state, like uh, building cloud computing facilities, and all of these things working with our colleagues and all of the institutions here at the University of New Mexico, other universities, uh, and our national laboratories, together with partnership with the state, we hope to really help to build that infrastructure, grow it, and I think we can bring investments here to New Mexico. Yeah, I guess the other thing that I'd add is it would would be to to um, emphasize the entrepreneurial aspect of this. Um, I was a graduate student in the late 80s, early 90s, um, and and graduate students didn't really start companies at that point. Um, you you kind of either went to a university or a national laboratory, or you you got a job working for a large company, um, and. Um, and, and so, you know, as, as I mentioned, I'm deputy director of, of one of these quantum quantum centers that we run with Lawrence Berkeley. Uh, so, I, so I spent a lot of time in the Bay Area. Um, and it often seems like every third graduate student there is thinking about leaving and starting a company. Um, and, um, and, and that's certainly an, an overestimate, um, but, but, but it's, it's an exciting opportunity. Um, and it would be really wonderful to get um, even a small fraction of that spirit here, um, because I think as as Ivan and John have have pointed out, uh, we have the, the 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 technological roots in this area, um, and it would be nice if we could create the 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 ecosystem that could that could nurture that type of of innovation and entrepreneurship. Yeah, question, please. Yeah, well, education is our business here at the University of New Mexico, and I think we're we're moving forward, but we do need to accelerate. And I think that doesn't just involve the University of New Mexico; involves uh, a statewide effort, which we are now discussing about growing a, a more integrated in, uh, educational program across the state with our other. Uh, uh, partners like the Mexico State University, Mexico Tech, and tribal colleges. We want to, it's, it's also not just about PhDs. This is their, if you ask the companies, what do you need? It's not, most of the work is not a PhD. 
in physics. If that's all we were talking about, that wouldn't really be something that would be of extreme benefit to the state of New Mexico, which we see. And so um, a coordinated effort is growing. We do need to accelerate it. We're working on it. And uh, the team here, the Quantum New Mexico project is about that. It is about bringing together all the stakeholders to ensure that we have uh, the training, the workforce development, the infrastructure, all of the plate pieces in place, but it's not going to be done by one uh, sector alone. It's not going to be done alone by universities or the national laboratories or the private sector, but we, the Quantum New Mexico project and the Quantum New Mexico coalition is about bringing together those stakeholders. And that's why you're here to hear to learn about, about this uh, good opportunity for our state. Yeah, so maybe I'll just touch on actually both the two questions, because Luis, you know, as a VPR, I mean, the, the workforce piece, the education piece, you and your colleagues are doing a great job of, I think the challenge of how do we define what the in-state looks like? How do we partner with legislators say, yes, I want to go to a distinguished Mexico university, because yes, maybe you want to grow up to be a professor, or maybe you want to grow up to work at a lab. Or maybe you want to grow up to work for a big company or a small company. If we can better envision those in states and have those in states be here in New Mexico, then it helps amplify and accelerate all the efforts that you and your colleagues are already doing. I think that's the missing piece. And that's why I think the two questions are actually pretty directly and deeply coupled. I've been this one.
Oh, you're, you're there. Okay. Yeah. So let's... Uh... Uh, wait, what, what happened? All right, everyone, we're going to reconvene, so please, uh, please take your seats. Thanks, everybody. We're going to get started again, so uh, if you, everyone can uh, please take your seats again. Thank you very much. So let's make sure your slides, will they be displayed? It's okay. All right. I want to make sure our AV, are, are we going to be able to present the slides here? Oh, very good. All right. Excellent. Okay. So our next session is to uh, announce the launch of the new Quantum New Mexico Institute. And for that, we have Setsu Matodi from Sandia National Lab. So Setsu, I'll, you can take it away. Uh, thank you. Hi. Uh, I'm the, uh, so I'm Setsu Matodi. I lead the Sandia's uh, Quantum Computer Science Group. We're about 23 people, uh, do all sorts of modeling uh, of devices, physics, uh, all the way through applications and algorithms development for uh, quantum information science. Uh, and uh, my uh, partner in this, in uh, launching and developing this institute, Professor Ivan Deutsch, uh, who leads the Center for Quantum Information and Control uh, here at New Mexico. Uh, so a few months ago, several months ago, um, Sandia's academic programs, formerly known as the Academic Alliance, uh, asked uh, through the uh, chief research office, uh, uh, the uh, chief research office at Sandia and uh, the UNM provost uh, asked us to rethink how we do our partnership with UNM and to formalize and make better our collaborations that are currently funded under the Academic Alliance programs as a partner university. Uh, so as part of this effort, uh, we developed a roadmap uh, where part of the roadmap is to uh, was a major decision to formally announce and launch the uh, Quantum New Mexico Institute, a joint institute between UNM and Sandia, uh, funded under these programs, uh, to uh, that that will make our collaborations between the two institutions in quantum information science formally under the same uh, organizational structure. Uh, and hopefully that would make them easier and better and uh, more efficient. Uh, so as part of this announcement, uh, we, we are starting the Institute. Uh, th th this is something that uh, is happening now. Uh, I will describe a little bit the objective of that Institute, what our planned uh, organizational structure is uh, in the interim, what are the key elements that we would like to see uh, in this Institute that we're working towards enabling. Uh, and uh, how to get involved and what our kind of what our timeline is. Uh, so in terms of the objective, uh, we want to build on what we already have to make our co collaborations better and easier in the future. Uh, one of those, uh, co uh, and this would help bridge critical gaps that we have as organizations. Uh, one of the uh, expanding research and development in QIS technologies is will allow us, uh, Sandia, under the Quantum New Mexico Institute, will allow, the, the hope is to allow Sandia staff scientists um, greater access to fundamental uh, open research that academic institutions are, really, uh, are good at. Uh, and uh, what uh, under that same institute uh, for Quantum New Mexico, uh, for Institute Fellows, uh, academic faculty from UNM uh, will have greater access to the mission and programmatic research that we do at Sandia, uh, and also access to facilities, uh, better access to facilities. Uh, the sub education, training, and workforce development is another core aspect. I think uh, you, you heard the uh, words of um, uh, retention, uh, reten uh, people that come here to study as students and uh, postdocs, we would like them to remain with us. We would like to provide the job opportunities and the academic opportunities, uh, either as uh, through startups or uh, uh, or through the labs uh, to, to remain here. And we have found 
a much stronger correlation of, uh, in terms of retention uh, when you provide uh, opportunities to be involved in multiple projects across different types of research, both mission and open research, uh, when we host postdocs and graduate students at Cyndia. So this would be a core element of our institute uh, and part of its objectives. Uh, and and hopefully this would uh, allow us to meet our, our nation's economic and national security interests uh, in quantum information science by enabling this workforce and the kind of research opportunities that we're trying to create. The, um, one of the major goals, again, in terms of why we're doing this is raising our national profile through a joint uh, formal institute uh, will allow us to remain competitive in quantum information science as, as it continues to be a top priority for uh, our U.S. science and technology investment. Uh, one of the, we heard that New Mexico is a quantum state. Uh, I'm not sure if New Mexico can be the quantum state, but that's certainly the hope. Uh, but, uh, but in terms of the ability to deliver on what our U.S. government needs in quantum information science, uh, hopefully we can be the leaders in this. Um, the way other institutes, uh, and this brings me to the next point, uh, the way other institutes uh, that we are, uh, we will follow in the footsteps, uh, 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 Jilla at, between uh, CU Boulder and NIST, uh, and JQI, the Joint Quantum Institute between uh, University of Maryland and NIST. Uh, have, we, we are going to follow their structure closely. Uh, we have many folks working with us today that have come through uh, these institutes and have joined those institutes precisely because of the uh, opportunities they provided. So, as I mentioned earlier, we're building on a strong, already very strong research foundation. And I'm taking a slightly different uh, track here to highlight our longstanding collaborations. You saw a lot of uh, pictures of a lot of the folks that are listed here. Uh, but it, it was surprising for me to find out that UNM actually st helped launch Sandir's quantum information science program with uh, Ivan and Eric, who happens to be in the room here. Um, I just made the picture bigger, Eric, when I saw you in the room, uh, but it was already in my slides. <laughs> um, but so there was a short course in quantum information science uh, that led to a, uh, a, a few, an LDRD project for a few months uh, that now uh, what you see here is a list of existing funded uh, LDRDs or large, something as, as large as the 115 million uh, quantum system accelerator center. Uh, these are, the, 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 there's a multitude of existing funded projects between UNM and Sandia where we support postdocs, uh, graduate students. Uh, the list of names that you see here, um, in addition to the already funded projects, there's a large list of names of uh, PhD students that have graduated uh, with their pr uh, principal advisors being Sandia staff, uh, with the students uh, being UNM students. Uh, some of those advisors are sitting here, Andrew Landau, Robin, uh, Andrew Brzezewski. Uh, the, they are formerly research professors at, uh, at UNM uh, while being staff at Sandia. Uh, and there's also support, Sandia supports some of the um, uh, outreach activities like the Squint conference that Ivan spoke, uh, spoke of. These are some of the, it, it's one of the premier quantum conferences that uh, uh, is going to become a key resource for uh, the Quantum Information Science Institute. The um, kind of, the, there's a few key elements that we need that we're working on uh, standing up for this institute to be able to succeed uh, in, the, in the long term. Uh, one of them is uh, prestigious to allow for prestigious postdoctoral fellowships and student research assistantships. Uh, student, graduate student, PhD students are um, kind of the, the 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 glue that uh, that enables ground the groundbreaking research that we do across the different institutions, uh, and providing uh, funded graduate student research assistantships. Uh, that can support the graduate student throughout their dissertation needs 
uh, both financially and, in term, and temporally in terms of time uh, that can align better than uh, they currently can align uh, would be something that is a major goal or element of this institute. Uh, similarly, postdoctoral fellowships, we have opportunities here to exploit um, uh, uh, the uh, ability of postdocs to be employed uh, both by UNM and Sandia. Uh, and we are working towards creating a foundational fellowship for, for postdocs uh, that would be a 10 year uh, funded commitment for several postdocs, both in the broader quantum information science area, uh, but also um, in uh, focused, uh, focused mission areas uh, such as solid state. Uh, quantum information systems, uh, um, and, uh, trap tie-ins, uh, et cetera. There, there's a, uh, when you provide opportunities, as I, as I mentioned just a couple minutes ago, when you provide opportunities for both, uh, that enables a very large retention uh, probability and also gives students and postdocs uh, the opportunity to both uh, be engaged in applied research as well as the academic side of uh, teaching and um, open science research. Another major element that we're working towards standing up as part of this institute is a uh, uh, faculty loan agreements between UNM and Sandia. Uh, the the faculty the, the joint faculty loan program at Sandia is going to be a major resource for us uh, to leverage here. Uh, outbound to Sandia, Sandia staff scientists will have an opportunity to teach uh, and be paid for that, uh, but also will be able to cr uh, fill critical gaps uh, at uh, that in terms of coursework that may not necessarily be supported uh, by the um, different departments at UNM. Uh, the uh, similarly, and, and actually just to make a point of this, uh, I've had several folks who have joined Sandia with the hope to be able to teach and provide and, and knowledge share with UNM. Uh, so hopefully this happens while they're still uh, Sandians. Uh, we also inbound to Sandia, the uh, faculty loan program will allow uh, um, uh, QNM fellows, uh, uh, UNM uh, faculty to have access to our facilities to uh, and to contribute uh, augment our needs in terms of meeting our deliverables for the mission research that we do. Uh, and this would also uh, hopefully enable um, experimental science to flourish in the way that theoretical science is flourishing here uh, in our between our two institutions. Uh, another core element is external space, uh, external to Cyndia. Uh I think uh, physical space provided through UNM that we're working uh, with uh, Ivan and our collaborators. Uh, it's going to be essential for our success here. This will allow us to broaden our access to uh, students, uh, long-term visitors, uh, uh, and mo most importantly, international students and international visitors in the long term, something that is uh, institutionally difficult to do at Sandia, but uh, is easy for us to collaborate with if available. Uh, and uh, we would like to have a very strong business uh, support division and grant writing. Uh, one of the uh, objectives of this is to expand our access to, um, uh, uh, to basic research, uh, to, to make it easier to, ho uh, to lead uh, joint uh, quantum centers uh, across the industry. And we saw we already have two major DOE centers here in our state, uh, NSF, uh, New uh, future NSF centers. Uh, hopefully, we can remain. We can be competitive in the proposals that we do um, uh, for uh, for these as we move forward in the long term. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, uh, just like we'll have a shiny website and marketing, and this will uh, again feed into the students and postdocs and uh, raising our national profile for them coming here. Um, so. In terms of governance, uh, again, we don't have a memorandum of understanding yet. This is still being worked on. Uh, it, the pace of working on this is accelerating rapidly, especially as we're having the launch today. Uh, but there's going to be three major governance uh, organizations for this. Uh, there will be an oversight board uh, that is composed of the leaders of the different institute of the two institutions. Uh, 
the SNL head, uh, uh, lead of the academic programs and the chief research officer designate uh, will be part of the oversight board. Uh, the UNM special assistant to the provost and the vice president of research or designate will be part of the oversight board. Uh, the oversight board uh, will be responsible like other similar organizations for overseeing the over operations and for allowing us to resolve substantial issues in facing the QNM Institute. Um, the executive committee, uh, which will be responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the Institute, will report to this oversight board uh, and uh, will be uh, equally distributed across uh, UNM and Cindia, at least to start with. Uh, and uh, obviously at the very, um, uh, the, the, the next major entity as part of the organizational structure is the QNM Fellows, uh, who will be responsible for the scientific direction, uh, for the furtherance of the goals, for the selection, for postdocs, for graduate students, uh, and uh, for carrying out the work that our institute will be, work, uh, will be doing. Uh, this is um, one of the key points here is that each institution uh, will be represented equally across all governance structures. Uh, and I purposely, we don't, uh, despite not having a memorandum of understanding, I purposely created this slide as a flat structure. Uh, I don't think any major decisions or substantial issues that the oversight br uh, board brings up or the executive uh, committee wants to do can be made without some form of consent and involvement of the QNM fellows and um, uh, this will not be a uh, traditional top-down structure. So with that in mind, uh, year one has already begun. Uh, we are working towards the detailed costs, the, govern the memorandum of understanding, the desired accomplishments, what checkpoints do we want to have as, we, as this becomes a stable uh, running entity. Uh, and uh, we want to be able to, during the first year, establish funded uh, fellowships for and graduate student assistantship programs, uh, including the memorandum of understanding for the faculty loan program. Uh, we are intentionally moving carefully here uh, because initially what we have control of is the um, task that we were given by UNM and Sandia. Uh, and our leadership to create this institute between the two institutions. But we recognize that there's other organizations here, um, uh, Los Alamos National Lab, the quantum, uh, the, the, um, the summer school that Los Alamos has that we saw is a uh, major benefit to attracting good talent to our state. Uh, we want to make sure that we, as we move forward with this, we can complement these efforts uh, and not come in on top of these efforts. Uh, so this will be a major for, uh, focus uh, for us during the first year in terms of how we develop the different uh, organizational structures. Um, the first five years, we hope to start uh, seeing the faculty uh, appointments uh, get established and have and begin the joint faculty programs. Uh, we want to have at least one well-established industrial partnership uh, for, with companies that are interested in quantum information science. Uh, and we want to start seeing um, uh, funded uh, growing external funding uh, and the development of uh, at least one uh, National Science Foundation Center uh, that is jointly funded uh, between the two institutions um, under the Quantum New Mexico Institute. Uh, and hopefully that will lead us to kind of as a first decade checkpoint is uh, to have at least 100 million in research funding over 10 years, which if you break it up over 10 years, it's not that much given the talent that we have. Uh, so we're confident that this will create kind of a stable um, fellowship programs and research programs that we could rely on then for the, for, for the long-term future. Um, so if you want to get involved, contact me, uh, contact Ivan. Uh, in fact, contact any of us that you see here. Uh, they will be able to direct you to the right place. Uh, we welcome anybody's help and that's it we have a, a few minutes if anyone has any questions at all we're happy to take any questions if anyone has them all right if not you know where to find this 
All right, very good. So we are going to be setting up now. Our next uh, session is our alumni showcase. Uh, and as I mentioned in my talk, uh, University of New Mexico has been uh, the, the place in which many of today's leaders in our field have been trained, where have received their education. And we're going to hear about their uh, experiences uh, here at the University of New Mexico and what they're doing today. So let's see, we're going to get that set up. Before we do that, the, uh, the moderator of this event is uh, Andrew Landall. Andrew Landall is a research professor in physics and astronomy at the University of Mexico, as well as a staff scientist at Sandia National Laboratory. So Andrew will lead this session. Thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, this might be the most uh, technically challenging of the uh, sessions that we're running today because uh, we have so many, um, as Ivan mentioned, we have so many distinguished uh, alumni. Uh, we had a huge pool to draw from. We tried to draw just a representative sample to show you all some of the diverse areas that our students and postdocs have become leaders in around the world. Uh, so we just have a handful today and uh, because of the, the various challenges involved, we're, they're joining us virtually today. So uh, I think we have a number of them up here already. Uh, so we'll have, uh, we'll, we'll kick this off with uh, three speakers who will talk briefly about their experiences and then we'll have a panel of five other alumni that I'll be uh, posing questions to. Um, so we're a little ahead of schedule once again here. So that gives us an opportunity to just make sure that all of the uh, AV things are working correctly here. Um, let's see, is, uh, do we have Sergio Boisho here, is he? On the line, he's our first speaker. I can't quite see. Yes, I'm, I'm here. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so we have Sergio, we have uh, Shohini, I see, and uh, Dave Hayes, is Dave on the line? Dave is actually registered as an attendee in Zoom. So there's probably some behind the scenes things you guys need to do. I see. Okay, so yeah, Dave Hayes, I believe you were sent a link uh, for uh, joining as a presenter. You might also have, also have one as an attendee. You have, might ha you'll have to join the Zoom link as a presenter instead of attendee in order to be able to join this panel. So you might have to log off and log on in. See, see we even do quantum IT service here. You know, we're, we're a full service organization. <laughs> Okay, so uh, while we're waiting for, for Dave to join, maybe I'll just say a few uh, introductory uh, comments here. Um, uh, as Ivan mentioned, you know, I kind of, I, I myself am working on being in a superposition of two places at once. I'm a, uh, both a research professor here at UNM, as well as a staff scientist at Sandia. And uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's been very challenging trying to serve two masters, you know, over the years doing that. It's been very, it's been very, very difficult logistically. And I'm really uh, hopeful and optimistic that this new Q&M Institute that you heard about from Setso is going to make the, that much easier, not just for me, but for people who come after me who want to come to New Mexico and are drawn like I am to the opportunity to have a foot in both worlds. I imagine there are many other people who are like me, you know, very passionate about doing real world work that it's going to impact the nation in the context of a national laboratory, but also equally passionate about training the next workforce for the future. And that's going to take, you know, the world in new and exciting directions. And so, uh, as Setso mentioned, we already have a number of people who are coming to Sandia expressing that. And I imagine we'll have a number of people coming to uh, UNM also that want to have, you know, a foot in both worlds also. So I'm, I'm really excited about this new QNM Institute. Uh, maybe I'll also say as a word of introduction while we're waiting for the logistics to start here, you know, Ivan spoke about the uh, second quantum uh, revolution uh, around, yeah, you could argue that started around the late 1990s, early 2000s, and that revolution was really driven by an idea, a powerful idea. The idea is that quantum mechanics isn't about atoms and particles, it's about information. And if you want to understand quantum mechanics better, you, uh, you don't want to understand, you want, if you want to understand what quantum mechanics is, you should understand what quantum mechanics does in terms of how it can process information, whether that's communication or computation or sensing. And that has sort of a, a dual output in terms of developing technologies in those fields, but also giving us a deeper understanding of what the limits and capabilities of information are in the universe. Well, I, I would argue that we're actually maybe on the precipice of a, a third quantum revolution actually right now. And that revolution is driven by people. 
What's happened is from the dawn of the second revolution to now is we've trained a workforce. You're going to be hearing from some of them. These people are well versed in these ideas of quantum information science, and they're excited. They want to go change the world. They see the promise of this new information technology that's based in quantum information principles. And that's why we're seeing right now so many new startups founding, so many major companies embracing these new ideas because they see it as transformative for their companies moving forward. Why we see so many educational institutions found, uh, you know, we, we were leaders early on here, but now we're seeing major universities around the world investing heavily in quantum information science. It's a very exciting time and it's a very people driven kind of revolution that's happening. And you're going to be hearing uh, some aspects of that in, the, uh, in the, the talks today from our alumni and from the panel as well. So hopefully that was enough filler for uh, Dave to join. Is uh, Dave here yet? Not quite, it appears. Um, so we'll, we'll start, though, without him. Uh, he's our, our third speaker in the session. Uh, so I'll uh, introduce you to our first speaker, uh, Sergio Boisho. Um, he uh, works at Google. And um, he is so passionate about joining us that he is actually on vacation right now with his family in Costa Rica and has decided to join us here to, in our Quantum New Mexico uh, kickoff symposium. We are, we are flattered and honored that he will, he's joining us. And uh, he is um, one of the pioneers, the architects behind uh, a really exciting test at Google that demonstrated uh, quantum computers' superiority over classical computers you know, he developed a, helped develop a test that would show that there was a, a, come up with a problem that a quantum computer could solve that no classical computer could solve equally as fast. He came up with a problem that Google solved with one of their superconducting qubit-based computers and solved in a matter of hours that maybe would have taken millennia with the most powerful supercomputers we have today. Uh, maybe to contextualize it for the New Mexico crowd, sometimes I call this a quantum computing trinity event. You know, it shows just the um, amazing radical difference in power you can have in this case in the context of computing when you harness quantum mechanics to solve a problem here. And so it's just totally different scales, you know, of computation that are possible with this. And, and really it's Sergio's uh, the brainchild behind a lot of this, uh, this whole quantum advantage uh, test that was done at Google. And um, uh, so he's done some really exciting things here and uh, I'm excited to introduce him uh, to tell us about his experiences uh, here at UNM. So uh, why don't you take it away, uh, Sergio? Hi, thank you, Andrew. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, sorry if I have some connection problems. As Andrew said, I had a vacation plan in Costa Rica, and I don't know how the wife is going to behave. But I'm uh, very honored uh, to uh, speak here as a UNM and Los Alamos alumni. Uh, I was a UNM a PhD student. I finished my PhD in 2008. And at the same time, I was a Los Alamos graduate research assistant uh, over my, the summers mostly, but also the last two years uh, part-time during the year. So as Andrew said, one of the advantages of uh, studying in New Mexico is that you can have a fit in both worlds. Uh, you know, I have a, an excellent education in the PhD, PhD program in New Mexico and excellent mentors, but also excellent mentors and maybe perhaps more applied research as a Los Alamos graduate research assistant. And now I am at Google principal scientist. Um, so let's see. So this is uh, the group at Google, around 100 people. Uh, we have a hardware group in, in Santa Barbara, experimental group, and a fab. We're building our own superconducting quantum processors. We're very excited trying to make uh, quantum computing a breakthrough technology. We're very practically oriented. We really want to land practical applications of quantum computer. Quantum computers. We have um, so we have a, a lab, a fabrication lab in Santa Barbara. We have a physics group, and we have a more traditional quantum computer science group, more a theoretical group. And I am the director of that group. So here is you know the people in the quantum AI group at, at large. And I will take the opportunity to say, well, if there are any UNM students here, you have the link. We're we're always hiring. So you have the link down there. Please you know look for open job postings and please apply. Um, so, as I said, I'm very honored to speak here as a UNM alumni, but here are some other uh, UNM alumni in the quantum group at Google that I would like to acknowledge. Zhang, who did the PhD, finishing in 2014. Uh, Jonathan Gross, another PhD student, 2017. Paul Klinov uh, is a UNM native, and he did his undergraduate degree in physics at UNM. Doug uh, Strain did a master's 
in computer science at UNM. Um, William Corney did a, um, a undergraduate degrees in both computer science and math. So these are some UNM alumni that are also in the Google uh, Quantum AI group. So um, I, I was just going to try to speak a little bit to what makes, I think, New Mexico a very special place for quantum computing and um, why I choose, as many other people, to go to New Mexico um, to, do, to do my PhD there and why it's been so influential in my career. Uh, one thing is that uh, New Mexico, quantum New Mexico, has been a center of excellence in quantum computing, quantum technologies for a very long time, way before my generation. That, that's one of the main reasons that attract me there. So Sandra said, uh, there is the University of New Mexico, who's had a large group in quantum computing for a long time. And, well, I was attracted by not just the, the faculty, which is excellent, and they, they have been you know, excellent hires since my time there. I, I want to start naming names because <laughs> I know most of them personally, and I could get into trouble if I forgot any of them. But anyway, uh, they, they had, you know, New Mexico had already excellent faculty before I joined. And in the last years, they've been hiring, you know, excellent uh, colleagues in, in the field of quantum computation, uh, but also excellent alumni before I went to New Mexico. I look at the list of people that graduated from New Mexico and that, that made it very attractive to me. If, if, you know, I saw a lot of New Mexico alumni were very successful and they are very successful and that's what attracted me. One of the reasons that attracted me to New Mexico. Also, I was doing a master's in Barcelona and well, just to name one name, you know, Chris Fuchs did a PhD in New Mexico in uh, quantum estimation. It's one of the, you could say it's kind of the Bible of, of quantum estimation. And in Barcelona, we were studying uh, the PhD thesis of Chris Fuchs page by page. And I thought, well, that, that must be a great place. But also it has national labs like Sandia and Los Alamos. As I said, there was a research assistant in Los Alamos. Um, so I did my PhD with Carl Caves, but uh, my, my mentor, I had, in Los Alamos, well, a few of them, again, too many names, but Rolando Soma, who is still in Los Alamos, I learned so much from him, uh, and other people like Lorenzo or, or Gerardo Ortiz um, in, in Los Alamos. Uh, well, and then there is the Sandia National Laboratory. So they work there, but actually I should mention some of my colleagues like um, Jonathan Gross, for instance, or, or Paul Klinov were uh, interns in Sandia National Lab while they were um, studying in New Mexico, in, in the University of New Mexico. So, um, so one reason is, you know, it has this critical mass of, of faculty and excellent researchers and an excellent tradition, but it also attracts excellent students. So, um, again, you know, before my time, I already saw a list of impressive alumni from, from UNM and Los Alamos and Sandia. And, and so I thought, well, if I go there, I'm going to learn from, you know, excellent colleagues, and that's what happened indeed. These are some of the um, colleagues I had the, the luck to do my, my PhD with. And, like uh, Steve, who's going to be talking later, Seth Merkel, Andrew Silva for um, Animes Data. And um, one of the great things about, and, oh, sorry, Brian is then one of the great things about being in, in, in this group is that we got to interact every single day and we learned, I learned so much from every one of them. Uh, we have a room where we all get together, Ivan's students at the time or Carl's students. And, you know, I was always learning from the problems they were studying. Maybe Seth will be working on quantum control with Ivan. Steve was working more with Carl on, on quantum information theory like me. So it made it, um, you know, I, I learned a lot, not only from the faculty, which is, you know, excellent faculty and, and they teach excellent courses, but also from my colleagues. And I think that's what this is still happening um, in New Mexico. So. Um, just to conclude quickly, you know, I, I would like to mention other reasons, in my opinion, that may make New Mexico and quantum New Mexico a very special, special place for quantum computing. One is I think it has very strong uh, scientific principles. Um, of course, you know, all PhD um, centers, you know, have, uh, you know, follow the scientific method. It's, it's hard to say that one place is, has a stronger scientific principles than another, but I you know, we'll say, I don't want to get into trouble, but I will say that in New Mexico, um, in my experience, the education is to really follow um, strong science and you're less influenced by by scientific fad or what is called the H in the pressure. So that means that when you're doing a PhD, you know, you're, you want to publish work and you want to get citations, of course, right? 
And sometimes there are, you know, topics that become a fad and everybody starts writing papers about them. And if you work in that area, you know, you're going to get citations, which is good. That's, you know, an objective metric or how well you're doing in your career. But uh, it's not always good for science. You know, it's, it's in the long term for science, it's better to really focus on an important problem and, and doing it well. So as, as Carl said, I think actually Carl's father used to say this, if a job is worth doing, it's, it's worth doing right. So I think that's something you learn in, in New Mexico. You take your time, you choose a topic which is worth doing, and then you take your time and, and you do it well. And, and you know, uh, people around you will, will sort of help you and push you to really uh, study whatever is the problem deeply and not just follow, you know, the fabs and publish papers quickly to get more citations. Um, it has excellent teaching faculty, not just people in, in, in quantum computing, but in other courses, I think other universities that maybe have um, more of a, of a name, uh, it tends to be because they have excellent researchers, which is, which is great, but they are not often, on, not all the time, excellent teachers. And in New Mexico, in, in my experience, all the faculty were excellent teachers. And well, another reason is just personally, you know, I had a family already when I went to do a PhD in New Mexico and it's hard to be a student with a family. And I found New Mexico to be more affordable. We were in the student family housing. There were great uh, families around other students. And that was a very enjoyable experience. And it's more affordable. It's harder to live. I now live in Los Angeles. So with a student salary, I think New Mexico is more affordable. And well, of course, you know, everybody knows the history of New Mexico, the food and, and the sky, <laughs> other things that make New Mexico great. So yeah, thank you for an honor to speak here. Thank you very much, Sergio. Um, I wanted to echo something that uh, Sergio said in his talk that I feel like maybe isn't represented here so well. You know, we like to puff ourselves up by talking about how great our faculty are, how great our staff scientists are at the national labs, or how great our alumni are. But what, what I think something that we should also be sure, clear to puff up is our current students and postdocs. They are amazing. They are why we come to work every day. They continue to be amazing, and they help each other as much as they, you know, they interact with each other as much as they interact with the faculty. And so one of the draws, you know, why would a student come to New Mexico is because of other great students. We make sure when we have prospective students come that they talk to other students to kind of get the ground truth of what's going on. And that attracts them to come here. And, and sadly, I'll say, you know, with, with COVID and all the past couple of years, that's something that's been missing. You know, we've worked hard to make sure that classwork can be taught virtually, but there's sort of student-student interactions where, you know, they're in a shared office environment where one student can go over to another and say, hey, I got a problem with this, you know, and that's the sort of casual interactions have been missing the past couple of years. And I personally am very excited that we're getting out of it now and that these students are being able to have those interactions. I think it's going to help uh, really help grow our center here moving forward. Okay, well, so with that transition maybe to education, uh, that's a great opportunity to introduce uh, Shohini Goes. Uh, she is a professor at uh, Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Canada. Uh, she has a passion for education as well as outreach, and she's a very clear and articulate conveyor of quantum information. She's even been a, a TED Fellow. I think she maybe currently is a TED Fellow. And um, uh, to just tell you a little personal story about Shohini uh, recently with me. Uh, so she was on uh, Nova uh, somewhat recently, a Nova episode. I was watching it with my family and my, and my two kids, you know, around there. And I said, hey, I, I know her. She, you know, she was a student, used to be here at uh, UNM. And the two, my two kids looked at me and said, you know her? Wow. So I was like a king for a day with my kids, which is like great. So thank you, Shohidi, for that. That was a, a big plus. It lasted a whole day. You know, that I was, I was a king because I knew who you were. Um, and so uh, we're going to hear uh, more from Shohini and her experiences here. So uh, with that, could, uh, I'd like to introduce Shohini Ghosh. Thanks so much, Andrew. And I hope I can say hi to your kids one day. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I'd um, tell you a little bit about my experience at UNM. And um, actually, I have a couple of old photographs that I dug up that I want to share a few couple of anecdotes with you and hopefully, uh, you know, tell you why UNM is still so meaningful and she has shaped my career in the way it has, which has been a little bit outside of the beaten path. So bear with me, I'm just going to share my uh, slides. So um, here's an old photo. Let me make it full screen here. 
<laughs> so, you know, in uh, in companies these days, you hear people say things like, I was employee number five at Microsoft or Apple, or maybe Sergio knows what number employee he is at Google. What I know is that I was graduate student number three in the famous Deutsch lab or Deutsch <laughs> group. And um, I was also woman graduate student number one. And this was way back uh, years ago when things were just starting. And in fact, this is such a memorable moment and photograph for me because it almost didn't happen. When back when I was a grad student, actually at, there was a point when I was thinking of quitting entirely. Um, I, hadn't, I had actually joined a laser physics lab and it wasn't going well. I wasn't progressing and I had some issues with another uh, student in the lab. So I was wandering around, wondering if there was another project for me. And I wandered into Ivan's uh, office and maybe he sensed something, but he didn't say, yeah, sure, join my group. Uh, he said, why don't you try it out for uh, a term and do a little project and see how it goes. And that's how it started. And then the first project that I started working on actually led me to do some calculations, you know, doing some, you know, this interesting, um, um, you know, dynamics of a single atom. And I was trying to calculate things and be really good and impress Ivan. And I kept getting this, these results which just looked wrong to me. And I felt awful. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, I'm, I'm such a failure. This, I'll never be able to do anything because everything looked really random to me. And so I, I finally got up the courage and I showed Ivan saying, I don't know, I can't do this code, nothing looks right. Um, and he said, well, think about it a little bit more. And I think this is what Sergio was also saying that, you know, you, you learn to look a bit deeper. And in fact, Ivan told me, why don't you talk to this other person, Paul Walsing, who can perhaps help you out. And in the end, we realized, well, this might be a signature of what we eventually realized was quantum chaos. And that helped me shape my entire PhD thesis. And in fact, my area of research that I've been focusing on my entire career. So for me, this was a really important moment to learn that, um, you know, it's not really about getting to a result. It's about that process of being able to push, push a little bit on whatever it is you're studying and dig deeper and look further and also to not give up and feel like a failure. In fact, as we know, all of science is about, you know, trying to make the old stuff wrong and then find new stuff that is more correct. And in fact, recently I was doing this interview with a, a Canadian science museum and I was telling them this story and part of, you know, this long interview. And then they picked out one part to make a little poster on. And what they picked out was exactly about this failure. So now the whole world knows, uh, at least in Canada, <laughs> students are learning from my experience at UNM to be able to celebrate failures. And I can definitely tell you that I'm definitely a, a, an expert on failing. And that's not a bad thing. My other photo that I dug up that brought back lots of memories was this one, which is a photo from the very first Squint conference back in 99, I think it was, when there was just a group of us, um, not huge as it is, it's grown over the years and the network certainly is even much bigger than those who attend. But back then, it, I remember it was such an exciting time because uh, you know, the, there was just this, this sense of the, this future coming up and this like, building it. And we didn't even have the language and the theory and the models. Forget about actual computers. Nobody could even imagine that, that we would be talking about real hardware at some point. But that's what was exciting about it. And the things that I learned there were about being able to have these spaces of open scientific conversation. And it didn't really matter whether you were a student or faculty, everybody was, uh, was engaging in these you know, deep ways. And there were connections made during that time which have lasted for years and years. And personally to me, that was really important because um, as Andrew mentioned, I spend a lot of time now doing things like educating and connecting and networking with many, many different groups um, and trying to bring in even more people into this kind of community that I learned was so important back then when, you know, going to Squint and building that network and that community. And now I get to, you know, talk to really different diverse groups going from, you know, doing these, these TED Talks as well as, a talk, you know, writing articles, even for Harvard Business Review and such. So this was something that I feel has really, you know, 
been something that I, I, I personally have found very important and uh, sorry about this pop up um, and has is something that I hope can be built on more at in QNM because that networking and communication, I think, is going to really lay the groundwork for this uh, new quantum revolution that Andrew was mentioning. And that's the third photograph I wanted to share with you is um, this one, which was a poster that used to hang above my desk when I was a graduate student at UNM. And, and it was there for many years after I left as well. I don't know where it is now. But to me, this was a poster about, of course, aiming high, but also about courage and you know being your own person and having an identity uh, uh, which goes beyond just physics itself. And to me, that was really important because UNM allowed me that space to be who I wanted to be and uh, you know, think about more than doing great physics and the next paper and the next publication, but how to impact the future society, which is, I think, what we're talking about now. And I've continued to do that. I wanted to share with you a more recent photo, which is this uh, conference that I'm involved with called the International Conference on Women in Physics. This, these are all women physicists from all around the world. And I feel like this is the kind of community and the future we can build if we can continue to embrace this idea of um, courage, aiming high, and having these deeper conversations going forward. So for me, looking back at my time as a grad student, I feel like there are all these foundations that were built that have led me to this, um, this path on, and this ongoing journey of building this future quantum society. Because as Andrew mentioned, this really is about a human re revolution. So at UNM and I hope elsewhere around the, the world, this revolution I hope will be driven by humans who will embrace not just the technologies, but also these ideas of what does it mean? Who will use the technology? When we talk about encryption and secure spaces, I hope we will also talk about safe spaces. And when we talk about sensing and building sensors, I hope we will talk about sensitivity also. And I hope when we talk about uh, computing and efficiency, we will also talk about accessibility. And if we can build that, that's the really exciting future where we can talk about these ideas that uh, can lead to a new new rollout of technology and uh, in the end i hope this becomes much more than one network and rolls out of, of course around the world as well as in in, uh, in uh, unm itself and i found this one final photo for you which is an old license plate, license plate from new mexico back before it was the land of enchantment back in 1932 it was actually the sunshine state before florida became the sunshine state and stole that name but i feel like this is a chance to steal that name right back and make it a quantum state so thank you thank you Thank you very much, Shohini. So you see what I'm talking about? It's like profiles and leadership. These students are amazing. Every one of them has become just an amazing alumnus or, uh, or alumna. I'm just I'm totally impressed by them. Thank you very much, Shohini. Our, our next speaker is uh, Dave. Uh, fantastic, Dave was able to join, great. Um, Dave, if you're able to like uh, close the window somehow behind you, though, it's so bright we can't really see your face very well where you're sitting. Uh, I don't know, just to... You know, this is like Zoom, you know, Zoom land that we're in now, right? <laughs> so, so, that might be a little bit better. Of course, maybe it's a little dark. Yeah, there we go. That's better. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, so uh, Dave Hayes, um, he's uh, one of our kind of homegrown uh, students. Uh, Dave grew up here in Albuquerque and did both his undergraduate and master's degrees here in our program in quantum information science. And uh, Dave has gone on to be one of the leaders of the, uh, well, helped initiate really the, the program in quantum computing at uh, Honeywell. Um, and it's grown to be so large that they actually split off to become its own kind of startup company now called Quantinuum. Um, so it's, it's, it's got its own identity separate from Honeywell now. And, it's, and so Dave has a very uh, unique experience of having, you know, lived in both the environment of a, a very large company, but also now in a kind of a startup environment as well. Um, most of the other panelists you'll see later are either in one world or another, but he, like me, has managed to have a superposition of, of both experiences at once. And so uh, I wanted to, to let him share with you what, what uh, 
his experiences at UNM uh, have been like and help prepare him for his current role and what that role has been like. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, take it away, Dave. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Uh, hopefully it's visible and everybody can hear me. Yes. Um, okay, great. So yeah, like Andrew said, I had a, a little bit different experience than some of the other speakers. Um, I was listening to Sergio talk about how he was a, attracted to UNM. Uh, my, my story is a little different. I was kind of bumbling around in a way at UNM and then um, was sort of sort of found found something to do uh, in the physics department. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm a Teams guy. I usually get used to this real quick. Okay. Uh, so I, I started at, at, in 1997 in the College of Ed. Um, getting trained in secondary education and physics and was helped along the way with the New Mexico Lottery Scholarship and uh, had a part-time job tutoring in the library over there on campus. So I was tutoring physics and calculus. And uh, along the way, I had several outstanding professors, uh, which has been mentioned a few times. And in particular, I'll give a shout out to Professor Basilic. Um, who was really instrumental in inspiring me to, to go down the road I'm on now. Uh, and so after I completed the education degree, I uh, enrolled in the, in the physics department. And my, my senior year, I was taking quantum mechanics with uh, Professor Ivan Deutsch. And uh, he was kind enough to offer me a, a position in, in his group as an undergraduate researcher. And so that was kind of my intro to professional research and you know so as an undergrad I just had one more year but I was you know sharing an office with grad students and postdocs and going to group meetings and um, writing a thesis and going to you know, the squint conference and other conferences and stuff and sort of getting to know what life might be like in that in that world and uh, decided I liked it and so uh, right afterwards I enrolled in the master's program over there at UNM and stayed in in Ivan's group for another two years and was helped along with some, a couple of fellowships. Um, like Sergio mentioned, UNM is, is uh, more affordable than the average school anyways, but it was nice to have the help. Uh, and then towards the end, I, you know, this, this group Sequick uh, was getting going and uh, I started talking with some experimentalists over in the, in Paul Yesen's group. And, you know, I wasn't working with them, but just Kind of getting to know them and, and seeing what life could be like in experiments as well. Uh, and um, I'd say like the main theme of, of my talk here was uh, something that's been brought up before, but maybe a little bit differently was what I came away with was um, a sense what a, for what a culture of excellence would be in science. I think that was really uh, emphasized at UNM. Um, and I'll come back to that here in a minute. Uh, but after UNM, I um, went to the University of Maryland to do my PhD, and I worked in an experimental group with trapped ions. Uh, and when I got there, I sort of was able to carve out a niche for myself, and because I, I kind of came in with a pretty good sense of, uh, or maybe a relatively pretty good sense of what was going on in the quantum information scene, and uh, my training at UNM and Ivan's group gave me a way to stand out as, as that group's sort of resident theorist in a way. Uh, and, you know, I wrote a couple papers that were that had a little bit more of a theoretical bent than the average um, paper coming out of that group or, or other groups like it. And so that ended up leading um, to a postdoc in Australia that that also had kind of a theoretical bent. Uh, and it was a pretty good fit for me. And and actually, while I was over there, I crossed paths with people from UNM, uh, in particular, Steve Flamia. It was, um, it was nice to see a familiar face when you go halfway around the world. And we actually worked together a little bit and wrote a paper together. It was pretty fun. Um, and it, yeah, like Andrew mentioned, I'm, I'm now at Quantinium. We used to be in Honeywell. We, uh, we're, we're a pretty big group now. We're getting close to, uh, you know, 400 people, it's, it's kind of bananas actually. Uh, and, but we started as a, a group of just 10 experimentalists. Um, I'm including myself in that category there. 
but you know, I had, again, I was, I had a little bit of experience in theory. And so, you know, when we needed somebody to start modeling and doing calculations and whatnot, I, I raised my hand and started doing that. And, you know, I started hiring more theorists and, um, I, I was kind of acting as the bridge between theory and experiment. Um, but as we've hired more and more theorists and people, um, on that team get more and more experience with the experiments, I don't have to do that quite as much as I used to. And these days, I'm sort of in a more uh, managing role. And so I, I manage about 13 theorists and, um, and the architecture group as well these days. Uh, so like I said, I, I mostly manage, but I, I spend some, some time on research, but it's pretty heavy in management. Uh, anyways, I, um, what I try to do is uh, bring this this culture of excellence to the management role, um, and so that's you know excellence in in listening to people and and hiring and organizational problem solving and trying to inspire individuals to to really embrace this culture of excellence so that they it's just more fun to to get it right you know. Um, and it, to this day, I'm still crossing paths with, with New Mexicans that I, I met down there. Um, in fact, I'm working with uh, Professor Deutsch again on a, a small project. And uh, I currently have two theorists on my team that graduated from UNM slash uh, Sandia. I got Charlie Baldwin from the Deutsch Group and Kieran Ryan Anderson, who was a, a student of, uh, of Andrews. Um, did most of his work at Sandy, I, I, I think. Um, and we also have some experimentalists, um, Matt Bone and Aaron Hankin come to mind. I, I don't know if that's even an exhaustive list actually. Uh, and there, there's some other contexts um, that we've had that have been super helpful. And in particular, Sandia kind of helped us get off the ground here in our group. And we're uh, helping us learn the ropes with um, these small microfabricated uh, ion traps and um, that was incredibly helpful. And we also have some work going on with Los Alamos as well. Um, so I'd say the, the main impacts for me um, growing up at UNM uh, was first and foremost, the realization that I could make a living as a scientist. <laughs> it might sound a little silly, but, you know, I wasn't, um, just wasn't a thing in my head and, until um, Ivan sort of encouraged me to join the group. and. Uh, you know, it wasn't a huge paycheck, but it was a paycheck. And it just dawned on me that, oh, yeah, you could probably do this um, as a lifestyle. Uh, and, you know, that group was incredibly welcoming, welcoming and friendly. And that's hugely important. So I, not only to attract people, but to, to make them want to stay in the culture, right? Um, and so this culture of excellence that I'm talking about, I tried to sum it up a little bit. I kind of think it's like, you know, asking the right and important questions. Once you ask those questions, getting things right and knowing what you're talking about and then being able to tell other people about it through good writing and presenting. And then um, last but not least, just being a good human being. I felt like that was really important over there at UNM. Uh, they, they seemed like they cared about people and uh, it's a really great place to be. Uh, and, you know, as I was writing this talk, I was kind of looking back and realizing that, um, you know, these, these tenets of excellence that I was talking about, to me, they were only obvious in research back then, but now I am where I am and I'm kind of realizing that, oh yeah, Carl and Ivan were, were really applying those concepts to organization building, even back in the, in the old days when I was there. And it's really shown, right? They've um, come up with this great group and uh, produced all these great students and postdocs and whatnot. And I think it's pretty ingrained in the DNA over there. And so that, that kind of thing has a way of lasting for a long time. So I have no doubt that um, the organization is gonna be successful in the future too. Um, and that's all I have. So thanks for your time. Well, thank you very much, Dave. And Thank you much, very much to the first three speakers of this panel, uh, or, uh, of this session rather. We're gonna transition to a panel, but before I do that, I wanted to give the audience here an opportunity maybe to ask a few questions of our first 
uh, three speakers uh, while we make sure the other uh, five uh, panelists are all uh, ready technologically and all of that. So do any of you have any questions? You, you got to hear from three people from three very different backgrounds that managed to be very successful after their endeavors here at UNM. Uh, does any of you have any questions for our first three speakers? Uh, yes. Um, there is a particular work being done at the high school level where you know, the high school gets students interested in science and they make uh, some good hopes of understanding the early Right. So that's maybe not a question. So the question is, is there work being done at the high school education level here in New Mexico um, that could help feed into this? Uh, maybe that's not so much a question for our, our three alumni speakers. They might not be able to speak to that so much. Uh, but I do know that I can speak at least at Sandia. We've become uh, very engaged in uh, high school outreach. Uh, there's a, a staff member, uh, Megan Ivory, I know, who's done a lot of work in that area. Um, uh, this, sometimes we call it Q through 12 uh, education instead of K through 12, you know, so we, uh, uh, we do have programs uh, at the high school level and uh, there's, uh, I think there's some sort of summer program that she's organizing. I don't know all the details about that, but I can get them to you uh, afterwards if you'd like. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, so, okay, so, so the question is, uh, uh, are there any things that we could have done here, you know, with like say this Q&M program or something like that, that could have gotten you engaged even sooner or interested even sooner? Uh, maybe I'll direct that one to you, Dave, since you started, you're the one that started out earliest here locally with that. Um, you know, looking back at your life experience, you know, growing up here, uh, are there any programs or something that could have like, you know, put uh, quantum information science on the radar for you as something that you might be interested in at an earlier point in your life? Uh, hard to say. I was kind of all, all over the place uh, before I got to the physics department. I don't know how interested um, I would have been. So actually what, you know, I mentioned the teachers getting me interested in, in physics, but another thing that got me interested in physics, um, I, I was reading sort of pop science books. There was, there was a, a book called In Search of Schrodinger's Cat. Um, it's really well written and, you know, there's no equations or anything in it, but the concepts are, uh, laid out really well. And uh, as you know, it's, it's a really interesting field and, and it didn't take long before, you know, it was about a hundred pages into that book where I was just kind of hooked. And when I taught physics in high school, you know, it wasn't very long, but, um, one of the projects I had the, the kids do was pick some book kind of like that, read it and, um, and do a report on it. And at the end of the semester, there was a lot of kids actually in that class that said that particular project um, really got them interested in science. Uh, you know, it's not like sitting down doing homework, writing equations and then getting graded on it. You know, they can go through it at their own pace. And these books are usually written really well. Uh, so I think that particular project um, in my high school experience was pretty successful and kind of stands out in my mind. So it's one idea. Oh, thanks, Dave. And maybe in the interest of time, I'll pose that question to just one more person. And it also gives us an opportunity for our last panelist to arrive, uh, Josh Combs, who will be joining us shortly. Um, I'd like to pose that to you, Shohini. I know you've worked a lot in outreach uh, to many different groups. Uh, you know, given your experience in outreach, what are some things you think that we could do here with the QNM project that could help, uh, you know, draw in students, uh, you know, young people sooner into this field? Um, that's a good question. Uh, what we find is that um, the best ambassadors to students is other students, actually. So I think that especially for high school students, it really helps for them to get some kind of a picture of um, what it means to be, let's say, a college student or the next level up from where they are right now. It's, it's much harder for them to imagine 
being a, you know, a, a, a professor or a researcher in, in a company and leading their own teams, that seems kind of unattainable when you're just starting out. So I think that our best ambassadors are our students. So it would be great to see some kind of an, um, uh, an outreach program developed among the students at UNM that could then reach out to um, high school or even earlier to get that ball, ball rolling. And then you just kind of go up one level. Okay, that, that's a good idea. Thank you, Shohini. Okay, well, I see that Josh has now joined, so I'll, I'll encourage our first three speakers to sort of hang around, but I'll be posing uh, questions to our panel of five new speakers now. Uh, what's that? I know, I see Josh is here, right? So that's why I'm transitioning. Thanks, Ivan. Um, so I will um, uh, transition to that. So I wanna give each of them an opportunity just to introduce themselves for a minute or two, tell them, you know, tell you all who they are, where they are now, and uh, what their background is a little bit. Uh, I'll go in uh, alphabetical order by last name here. So I'll start with uh, Raf Alexander. Uh, Raf, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thanks, Andrew. Um, I assume you can hear me okay. Uh, yeah. I'm yeah. Raphael. Yeah, I'm here in Toronto at the uh, quantum startup company, Xanadu Quantum Technologies, which is uh, a photonic-based platform for trying to build this quantum computer. Um, I stopped by Seaquick for about three years as a postdoc. Um, I had the chance to, uh, I did my PhD in Australia uh, at the University of Sydney, shorter programs there. So I felt a bit undercooked. So UNM gave me that, uh, that uh, chance to get broaden my expertise and then sort of plug into it as a more sort of leadership role here at Xanadu, which is, uh, I'm really enjoying. Uh, thanks, Raphael. Uh, so next, uh, Josh Combs. Uh, so Josh, can you tell us about yourself a little bit? Yeah, hi, my name is Josh. Uh, like Raf, I did my PhD in Australia, and uh, there's a, uh, a long history of excellence in quantum uh, anything in New Mexico. And so as a, a graduating student, I wanted to go to New Mexico and sort of learn from the grades. So it was fantastic to interact with people like uh, Andrew and Ivan and Carl and later Aki Massa and Elizabeth. So it was just a, it was um, a real pleasure to come. And uh, currently I'm a professor at the University of Colorado. So just a bit north. Thanks, Josh. Uh, next is uh, Steve Flamia. Hi, I'm Steve. Uh, yeah, I did my PhD at UNM um, uh, with Carl Caves. Um, I uh, was very excited to do my PhD at UNM. I, th I think uh, it was probably the best place for me to be. Uh, and um, I really credit my, whatever success I may have had, I, I absolutely credit to having gone there. I don't think that I would have succeeded in any sense if I had gone anywhere else, to be honest. Um, so I'm really uh, grateful to be on this panel. Um, I was, uh, I did, postdocs at places. I was a professor at the University of Sydney for a little while. I didn't supervise uh, Raf's PhD, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, and uh, I recently left academia to join industry and I work at Amazon now. Amazon, yes, thank, yeah, thank quantum, you. The, the, uh, it's, a, it's a quantum position. We're trying to build a quantum computer. <laughs> yeah. I'm not like delivering packages or working on them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wait for Amazon Prime Quantum. That'll be the new thing. <laughs> It'll be quantum teleported right to your house. Uh, our our next uh, panelist is uh, Shayoni Ray. Uh, Shayoni, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Hi. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very honored to be among the panelists. So uh, I did my PhD in India in condensed matter physics. And then I moved to the US to do my postdoc at UNM. So I was there for three years. I worked with Ivan, Akimasa, and Tamim. And um, after that, I did a postdoc at University of Waterloo. And now I'm working at INQ. So INQ is another uh, quantum computing company. We are building a trapped ion device. Um, and 
Yeah, I think Sequake uh, and UNM was my break into quantum information. And I don't think, and, and I think without that opportunity, I, my career would have been very different. So yeah, so thanks to Sequake and everyone else. Uh, thanks, Shaoni. Uh, maybe I'll just mention to the crowd here, you know, those of you who are very interested in this workforce development and economic development aspect of it, this company, IonQ, that was a startup that Shaoni has joined, it just recently uh, went public. It's worth over two and a half billion dollars now. I mean, that's the kind of like growth that's happening in this field. It's, it's, it truly is exponential. You'll hear more about this for the kind of thing from the other speakers as we go through the panel. Um, uh, Travis, uh, Travis Shulton, uh, uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thank you very much, Andrew. So hi, everyone. Travis Shulton. I graduated from the University of New Mexico in 2018. I joined the IBM Quantum team shortly thereafter, working as a quantum computing applications researcher. I spent most of my time working with enterprises and startups and doing research and stuff like that. Over the past, say, six months or so, I've taken on a new role as an applications architect in which I think more about how we're actually going to make quantum useful in the context of enterprise workflows, you know, leveraging cloud technology, so on and so forth. And sort of in my spare time, I sit on the board of directors of a nonprofit called the Unitary Fund, uh, which is helping create a quantum technology ecosystem that benefits the most people. Okay, thank you, Travis, and thank you all for your introduction. So, uh, so let's start here with uh, just asking some questions of you all. Um, so the first thing I think uh, folks would like to hear a little bit more about, you gave us brief introductions of yourselves, but I, I think I was wondering if you could uh, share what your, share more with us about your experiences as either a student or a postdoc at UNM, and maybe explain to the group here, you know, how exactly that helped prepare you for the work that you're currently doing in quantum information science. I, I imagine that there might have been some surprises in your current position that you wouldn't have expected, you know, given your training at, at UNM, and also some things that you felt very comfortable with, given that your training, your training that you had UNM, here at UNM. And I'd, I think we'd all like to hear uh, about that some more. So again, maybe I'll just go through the cycle here. I'll start uh, with you, uh, Raf. Uh, can you share with us uh, your thoughts about that? Sure. Um, so I'm in a sort of weird position because you know, building this quantum computer is hard. There's many ways of doing it. And I somehow did my PhD in this very niche thing. When I started, it seemed like science fiction like even compared to the other ways of building this thing, like what I'm working on is like, oh, really? Um, uh, but then somehow um, these companies started cropping up and they wanted to build these things. And um, so I had the option out of my PhD to jump straight into industry if I wanted to. Um, but as I said, feeling you know, uh, like as a scientist that I wanted to do a bit more development, uh, I had the opportunity to come to a postdoc at UNM. And there's, uh, I don't think there's any place better that I could have gone to keep learning and maturing uh, to not, not necessarily, like if I, had I joined initially, I may have been a great specialist, but to give me practice, uh, uh, I started projects with basically all the professors there, not all of them ended up succeeding, but, you know, I talked to Ivan, I talked to Professor Deutsch, I talked to Professor Akimasa Miyake, uh, uh, Professor Elohim Basera, uh, uh, and, and Andrew, you as well, we had some discussions. Uh, and just in terms of breadth uh, and, and getting those skills, also not just research, but talking to the students, uh, organ helping to organize squint, uh, it's starting to sound like a bit of a list, but it, th there's just in so many different ways, lateral directions I picked up and broadened my expertise. But also, as was touched on earlier, UNM, you're really encouraged to think deeply about things. And um, I found it is very, you know, as a postdoc, it can be very, uh, one of the challenges you find is finding an identity for your research. And UNM is such a great place to do that because so many of the great ideas in our field started here. And there are so many great people who have been through here. People like uh, Josh Coombs and Steve Lemire percolated out of New Mexico and came to Australia and influenced me when I was uh, a neophyte, uh, still am, I guess. But uh, it was, uh, uh, yeah, uh, now, now I'm, 
I'm losing the flow. I'm ranting, but it's hard for me to express just how 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 much of an impact this uh, this place uh, gave to my career. And then once I I um, uh, I feel like I, I matured and felt confident, I was able to. I'm actually in a superposition state as well, like many of us. I still have a fellowship position at an academia at RMIT University, um, but I'm taking a sort of postdoctoral sabbatical at uh, Xanadu because I feel like now is the time when I can maybe help contribute at this critical point in the technology. And all of my UNM experience, I feel more and more, I'm relying more on what I developed in those discussions, not just on the specialist niche information I got during my PhD. Is that, oh, yeah, that's thanks, Raf. Uh, so how about you, Josh? Can you tell us a little bit about your uh, experiences here at UNM and how it prepared you for your current job? I mean, now you're a professor teaching students. You know, you got to witness some of that here. How has that influenced your, the way you approach teaching, for example, at the university? Yeah, so I mean, I think the um, uh, education that I received at UNM, even as a postdoc, was very high quality and certainly set me up for success in multiple ways. Um, I, I like. Uh, all of the panelists, I guess, I spent some time in the quantum industry too. And so this is just a fact that the education you get at UNM um, is very high quality and it's very broad. So it prepares you for working on things like quantum computing and quantum sensing and quantum communications. And moreover, things like, you know, Professor Deutsch's uh, quantum optics class prepare you to think about hardware as well. So it's, it's very broad. And it's not just UNM, it's really the whole ecosystem uh, around uh, UNM. So it's, this is including Sandia and uh, Lanol and all of these places. And it's just a really rich place to be. And, and I, it was very exciting to be there and I, and I really appreciate it. So yeah, thank you. Uh, My turn? I, I think you might've cut out there. I'm not sure if there's a technical glitch or not, but. Uh, yeah. I think he's, I think he. Okay, we got a little bit of a freeze here. Uh, well, I, I, while we're getting that fixed, I'll, I'll comment that uh, I was actually very pleased to hear Josh talk about the breadth of education. One thing I think that sometimes it can be a, a problem of a narrowness of view if you talk about workforce education too much, that you start to think of universities as like trade schools and they're just training you to do a trade. And that's something we try not to do in our program here. We actually try to you know, give them a university education with breadth so they can prepare for the unknown. That's what we're really trying to prepare them for. We, we give them a broad-based education in the area field of quantum information science, but we don't train them to just do one thing and, and one thing only, you know, as a skilled worker. We train them to sort of be agile and prepared to, to handle new areas as they emerge. And uh, I think, you know, like this dawn of the, the growth of startups and things like that, they were able to pounce on that quickly. And uh, we've seen people, you know, go to all these different kind of uh, fields since then. Sorry, where did I cut out? Challenges fix themselves. Okay, I, I think you're back, Josh. I think we can Sorry, hear you. Where did I cut out? We, we hear you. We heard you say, Oh, where did you cut out? Josh, I heard you to the end. Oh. I heard you to the end. I, I, I don't know. Okay. I see. I, I guess my second point was just that uh, it's not just UNM. There's a whole ecosystem in, in uh, New Mexico, which includes Sandia and Lanol and many other places. So it's a very fertile place. And, and I'm really excited about this initiative. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Josh. So about, how about you, Steve? You know, how did your experiences at UNM help you prepare you for the work you're doing today? And, and when am I going to get that Amazon package? Yeah, I, uh, that's right. Uh, so um, <laughs> next day, two days or something, I guess, if you're a Prime <laughs> member. I, I don't know, to be honest. Um, yeah, uh, UNM, um, as I said uh, in my little intro, I think that UNM almost uniquely uh, was able to prepare me personally. And I think there are a lot of people like me uh, in the workforce. Um, so for example, I'm, I'm a first generation academic, uh, like, uh, you know, my parents have high school degrees and that's it. And um, I think uh, when you have a background like that, you have less confidence. And um, I've, uh, I see, students at fancy places like uh, at Caltech, which is uh, just across the street from my Amazon office. There are kids there that have a lot of um, 
they come in with a lot of confidence built in. Maybe they were just the smartest kids uh, in their school. Um, those kids are going to succeed. Many of them will succeed uh, no matter what. At UNM, I felt like there was a special effort to ensure that people like me would succeed and achieve our potential. Um, this meant so much to me at UNM that, um, you know, I, I think UNM has this incredibly special ability to unlock potential. Um, and I, by contrast, you know, I think it would have been a curse to me if I had gone to school at Caltech for my PhD. I don't think I ever would have been able to muster the confidence needed to achieve uh, what I've achieved. I think I would have uh, muddled my way through a degree and then gone into, I don't know, maybe gone into finance or something is like the thing that everybody always does. Um, UNM, um, through their, uh, through, you know, in my time, uh, there was, you know, Andrew Landau was there, uh, you know, and I, and also at Los Alamos and Sandia, there were people like, uh, you know, at Los Alamos, Howard Barnum was there at the time, Rolando Soma, um, but Carl and Ivan, especially, they really uh, ensured that uh, I not only got skills, but I got confidence. Uh, and that to me was probably the most meaningful thing. So, uh, you know, I second what Josh says about the ecosystem. That was absolutely crucial. But for me, it was really just the fact that they cared to ensure the success and to unlock the potential of the people that were there. That was really meaningful and special. And um, I wouldn't be where I am today without it. Uh, thanks, Steve. Yeah, I, I think you make a good point. That's part of what we do here is we're kind of confidence in incubators. It's the kind of thing that UNM does that maybe other universities don't do as much. And I'll say, uh, personally, I, I, I definitely saw you grow in confidence over the years, Steve. And I can remember, you know, towards the end of your time here, you were even saying like, hey, let's start a summer course in surface codes and neons. Let's do it. And everybody's like, okay, great, let's go. And you led a whole summer course on just that topic. And so um, just watching you grow through your career here was uh, exciting for me to watch, I'll, I'll say. Um, okay, so the, I'll pass on the question to you, Shayoni. So Shayoni, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how your experiences here, you know, help prepare you for the kind of work you're doing now and other undertaking? Uh, so my background was very different. So I was in condensed matter physics. It's a different branch of physics. I did my PhD in that. And then when I got the offer, uh, the postdoc offer from CPIC, uh, my approach was, Quantum information, it's a two, like you are only doing a two level system, right? How hard can it be? So I was, <laughs> as you can imagine, <laughs> I was pleasantly surprised when I came. Um, so I became like Alice in Wonderland. It was, uh, it was very interesting. It was uh, very challenging as well, but I had a lot of fun. So without that, if CQIC, if UNM had not given me that opportunity, I would have done something very different and probably, I'm not sure what I would have done. So CQIC has given me this opportunity to, uh, to, to learn a new topic, to enter a new field, to ask questions. So, um, so I'm thankful to CQIC and UNM for that. And then um, other than that, what I felt was, of course, like being a postdoc, uh, like we, we got, uh, this we had this freedom to collaborate uh, with anyone at Seaquick or outside Seaquick uh, we we wanted to uh, work with. Uh, we also had uh, generous travel grants to visit uh, other institutes, other academic institutions, national labs. So that was uh, that was pretty nice. And of course, like uh, the group meetings where Andrew, you and your students came and the rest of Seaquick was there. There were talks from Lanel as well. So that was very, uh, uh, I would say, like educating for me. So, uh, and we, we discussed papers and it was a very open and healthy interaction there. Um, and other than that, what I felt, uh, what Seaquick rekindled in me was why I came into research. So the, the fascination of taking up science in your high school, like you dream about being a scientist, right? 
So you think of solving the greatest, most important problems. So see quick. So, so while doing research, you kind of get uh, lost in the mundane, uh, uh, less exciting stuff, less exciting things of research, right? Like making a calculation work, making a code work, like those can get pretty bo boring. But the questions that uh, people at CQIC ask, the problems that they, uh, they address, those, like when you, when you think about those, that gives you that uh, energy, that boost to continue to do research, to, 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 uh, to remain being motivated in what you're doing. So I think that, that played a big role in uh, what I'm doing now and what I'll be doing in future. So yeah, so thanks to UNM and CQIC and everyone there. Uh, thanks, Shayoni. Uh, I want to amplify uh, something that you said there. You mentioned the, the group meeting. Uh, so the, the Center for Quantum Information Control, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, there's a group of a number of faculty and their students and postdocs that meet regularly uh, once a week uh, here at Sandia. And uh, there's a, been a structure for that meeting that's been going on for, gosh, maybe 20 years or something now, I'd say. Yeah, Ivan's nodding his head that has been very successful for our students. Uh, we spend the first hour reviewing papers that are posted to an uh, electronic preprint server called the Archive of papers in our field. And we go through, we have a, a local website where you know, during the week, students, postdocs, faculty nominate papers that they want to talk about and share with the broader group. So uh, there's just so many papers now in the field, it's hard to keep up. It's a great way for the group collectively to be aware of what's going on and distribute that load of keeping up because it's hard for anyone person to it's sort of a burden sharing there. But there's also sort of a teaching opportunity. Our students uh, talk about the papers, learn how to read a paper and, and kind of critically get to the key points and talk about them. And then the second hour we spend having a student or postdoc talk about his or her research, and we cycle around the whole group over the course of, well, the group is so large now, maybe it takes two years to get to everybody now. But uh, we cycle around and everybody talks about his or her research. And uh, it's oftentimes the first opportunity for our graduate students to give a talk to an audience. And uh, after his or her talk, we give a, a feedback on the talk uh, constructive feedback, it's supportive feedback, you know, or friends, uh, giving them, you know, feedback on how to make their talks better. And uh, I wanted to bring this up before I pose the question to Travis, because uh, Travis, among, I think, all of our, our graduates, has become extremely passionate about giving good talks and making the, the oh, slides stop well. Stop it, and Andrew, stop. <laughs> no, it's true, though. He, you know, I mean, he will tell me. I'm blushing me that over the, here. What's that? <laughs> yeah, the, no, you know, I'm I mean, blushing he blushing over here. You can't see it. Blushing. Okay, yeah, yeah. No, but it's it's true. He's he's very passionate about it. I mean, he would even tell us that the color scheme on our heat maps for our graphs needs to be a different color palette so it looks better, you know, things like that. So uh, Travis has become a master of that, and I'm sure he's taken that skill with him to uh, IBM. Uh, but I wanted to hear uh, more broadly also, as I said for you, Travis, you get the last word in this cycle here of question. Um, could you tell us maybe some more about how your experiences, maybe even beyond that, have uh, helped uh, shape the role that you serve in now at IBM? Sure. Uh, thank you for that tee up there, Andrew. Um, so over the past year or so, I've actually had a chance to give a couple of talks about my journey to the quantum computing industry. And as part of that talk, I always make sure to mention my time at UNM and CQIC. And there are actually two aspects that I tend to emphasize in the talk. Um, the first, as some of the other speakers and panelists have alluded to, is just the very supportive environment that CQIC created for me as a graduate student, which meant that I could take calculated risks in a context where messing up was going to be okay. Um, so one summer, uh, I was less ambitious than Steve Fumia. I organized a, uh, a workshop with a Jonathan Gross and Xiaodong Chi on a just scientific computing. Like, how do you actually write Python code and version control and all that good stuff? And I had never done anything like that before. I got buy-in from the PIs and like, all right, Travis, go do it. And it was nice to be able to learn how to organize teams and come together around a common vision, so on and so forth. Uh, second, is actually this collaboration which we heard about earlier in the day uh, between UNM and Sandia National Labs, where I was a student intern during the duration of my PhD. And what was really helpful there, uh, although I think my advisor, Robin Bloomcoat, found it very weird that his intern would show up to the department meetings at 9 a.m. in the morning, was just being part of an organizational culture, right? Like academia has a culture and organization has a culture. And in many ways, being part of 
Sandia as that student intern and just sitting there and seeing like, this is how an organization works and this is how it runs itself, so on and so forth, actually made it much easier for me to align myself and smooth my transition into IBM Quantum. Uh, thanks, Travis. That was a, uh, I appreciate that. It was a very good overview. Also, just a comment to the people on Zoom. Uh, every time I turn around, I'm not like turning my back to you. The, the, the screen is behind me that shows your face. So what, the reason you keep seeing the back of my head is that I'm turning around looking at you. So uh, uh, I'm not ignoring you. Just to let you know if you're wondering, why does Andrew keep turning around? That, that's what's going on here. Um, OK, so uh, uh, maybe I have time maybe for one more question we can kind of do a deep dive into uh, with you all. So thank you very much. Um, the, the next question I wanted to ask you all is, um, uh, where do you see quantum information technology heading? Uh, and that can be in many areas. It can be in communication, computing, sensing, whatever. Uh, where do you see that heading? And it, where do you, what do you think the role of higher education will be as it's uh, heading in the direction that you see? And, and maybe combined with that, where do you think Q&M could help uh, you know, uh, foster the kind of interactions that are going to be necessary, perhaps, between higher education and that technology development? Uh, so I'll, I'll pose that question uh, to you first, Raphael. Uh, could you share your thoughts on that, please? Yeah. Um, yeah, where it's heading, it's changing so quickly. I mean, as I said, from from when I started getting into it, because I was, you know, reading those pop science books Dave Hayes was mentioning earlier, getting excited about the quantum physics of it, and then finding actual projects I could contribute to at an undergrad level. And then now there's companies building these, you know, devices, quantum computers, but there's also, you know, sensing, uh, you know, quantum technology is being used today to give real world advantage to a technology that isn't quantum. For example, in uh, gravitational astronomy in LIGO, they put squeezed light there. It's a quantum idea that goes back to Carl Caves and that's, giving us a real world advantage, right? So it's kind of gnarly to uh, be around, I haven't been around that long, but even that, you know, seeing that transition um, and it's exciting to, you know, we, we don't really know what all the applications will be or also the feedback into academic questions and I could, you know, a lot of quantum information, a lot of, has allowed for a lot of influx of ideas from adjacent fields like computer science, information theory to go back into physics and sort of bring that up to date a little bit. Um, what, what do, you know, from, a, from where I am right now, what role does a universe, you know, I, I mean, speaking from my own experience, they need talented people. Uh, uh, the PhD program at a place like UNM, doing a postdoc at UNM, makes you a fantastic candidate for a company uh, like the one I'm at. Uh, uh, we, that's, that's really uh, where you learn how to, uh, I mean, the challenges that we're facing, we don't even actually know if we're going to be able to succeed here. It, it's, it's, I mean, I tell people that I'm in here in the business to not only build this thing, but learn how difficult it is to build it. Um, and it's, so it's a great, it's a great avenue for scientific inquiry, but you need you need that scientific training, but there's now room for people with expertise outside of physics. Like where we have, if you're if you're an expert, um, have a master's degree in high performance computing, or if you know about uh, uh, if you're a systems engineer, we need you at these companies now. Uh, and uh, so it doesn't have to be a, a sort of traditional PhD in you know quantum information theory kind of thing. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll leave it to the to my fellow panel members to elaborate further. Thanks, Raphael. The, um, uh, I can speak, uh, you know, from Sandia's perspective, the, the hiring, uh, we're very um, uh, staffing limited. It's, uh, you know, the, there's such demand for people in this field right now that uh, there's competition from industry, from the national labs, from academia. It's like nothing I've ever seen before. I mean, the competition is just outrageous. So uh, the more students we can train in this area, the more, you know, they've almost guaranteed, a, you know, a job. Maybe it's maybe even like football and get a job even before they graduate. You know, it's almost that crazy right now, you know. So it's, uh, it's very important to train students for the future. And, and uh, uh, to use a word that you used in your uh, answer there, maybe we, uh, Ralph, maybe we should be calling New Mexico a gnarly quantum state, huh? <laughs> 
Um, so Josh, what are your thoughts about uh, where you see technology going and the role of higher education, you know, with also your role as a professor at uh, the University of Colorado? Yeah, so, so maybe I'll start with where do I see it heading and, and maybe even step back a step, which is um, I think one of the things that's different about quantum technologies when you compare that to classical technologies, whether it's computing or communications, is the kind of hardware that exists in quantum is very diverse. Everything from atoms to semiconductors and superconductors and, and, and optical elements. Um, and this is kind of unlike the computing platforms classically. So you need a very broad education. Um, moreover, another thing that's interesting is because it's a new uh, industry, there's many uh, roles for companies that are not exactly quantum only sort of supporting roles. And so it's not just in purely quantum computing or quantum communications companies that you need quantum engineers. I think broadly the economy is gonna to have to adjust where companies have quantum aware engineers, people that know something about quantum uh, in order to interface with some of these other companies. Um, and so I think it's, a, it's a, a much larger field than we might naively think. Um, and because of that, I think the role of higher education is to really uh, train these students and we've mostly been talking about graduate level education and education of postdoctoral scholars, people that have their PhD, but there's a huge role and need in these companies for uh, talented software engineers, uh, mechanical, electrical, uh, that have some knowledge of quantum. And I think this is another area that UNM can really grow in and um, become a champion of, of education at quantum education at that level. Again, within the ecosystem of all the other amazing things in New Mexico. Oh, thanks, Josh. Yeah, it reminds me, sometimes I wonder what it must have been like at the dawn of discovery of electricity, somebody positing the possible future career of electrical engineer. They must have thought, what could that possibly mean? Engineering electricity? I just discovered, you know, what could you possibly do with it? Um, and just like electrical engineers have a wide diversity of things that they do, everything from, you know, power lines to designing computers. Uh, I think, you know, quantum engineers would also have a, a there's a wide range of technologies that uh, are used in the quantum information field that uh, I think could uh, benefit from that kind of training. So very good, very good uh, feedback. Thank you, Josh. Uh, so Steve, uh, what are your thoughts about uh, quantum technology, quantum information technology? Uh, development and uh, where do you see the role of uh, higher education in that? Uh, you have a, you're sort of uniquely situated with Cal, as you mentioned, Amazon's uh, quantum information effort is uh, sort of right there uh, next to the, or maybe even on the Caltech campus. So you have kind of a tight connection there in your position. Yeah. Uh, so I hope uh, maybe you can see my screen share. Um, in terms of where the field is going, this is a bit physics centric. So APS is the American Physical Society. This is the membership. Uh, fractional growth. Not the Albuquerque public school system for nope, the local No, 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 no. It's the American Physical Society. So this is the Society of Physicists. It's not just Americans, but, you know, people from all over the world are APS members. And uh, it's subdivided into divisions, uh, one of which um, I uh, maybe I can't, uh, I don't have a laser pointer, uh, but down near it's the bottom of quantum information is um, a standout. So a lot of memberships in this society declined because people didn't renew their membership because it didn't make sense to renew your membership during COVID when one of the principal benefits to membership is that you get to go to society meetings and that wasn't a thing during COVID. I mean, COVID is still obviously uh, around, but uh, uh, while COVID restrictions were so strict that we weren't having any in-person meetings, um, uh, membership shrank. And no matter how you choose to aggregate the other data, uh, for all the other divisions in which uh, physics research gets done, um, uh, nothing stands out like quantum information. So um, the year over year growth, and this trend goes back, I, I actually made a graph like this three years ago, and uh, the growth from 2015 to 2019 was even stronger, it was 75%. Um, so the trend since at least 2015 has been extremely strong growth in this field. I predict that this will continue. Um, I know that uh, people, you know, people ask, where's the field going? People are worried, myself including, about a notion of quantum winter analogous to AI winter, uh, which is a concept artificial intelligence um, had been overhyped and overpromised and then underdelivered 
and they suffered major setbacks. And I do believe that there is a lot of hype in the field of quantum mechanics, but I also think that um, it delivers on so many different ways that uh, in spite of the fact that there is unquestionably hype surrounding what quantum computers will achieve in the near future, the long-term prospects will be very strong. Anyone, and I'm gonna transition now to answering what you were saying about the role of higher ed, uh, but um, getting uh, training in quantum information science, um, not just from a physics program, which is uh, the data that I just showed are special to physics, but uh, you can get it in mathematics, computer science, electrical engineering, even chemistry. Um, it really prepares you uh, for a lot of other careers, like Josh was saying, sort of quantum adjacent roles. Um, these are going to be increasingly common. Um, so I don't see uh, uh, the, I, I don't think that this is a bubble. <laughs> I think that things will continue to grow. Uh, John von Neumann, who um, was one of the uh, primary drivers of the entire concept of the modern computer, um, really absolutely central uh, to the modern computer. Uh, he said when he was pitching this idea to people that what are the applications for these things? Well, we really, to be honest, you know, he gave a list of applications for these things. Um, but then he said, you know, we really don't know. We won't know until we can build them because the best applications are going to come along only uh, once we have these things and can actually play with them. And we're actually a long way from having these things. But the amazing thing about uh, quantum information science and why it is such a great investment from the higher end perspective to train students in this field is that it keeps on giving. It's not that there's going to be one day, like it's not that we're we're building our way towards quantum computers and you know it's a slog and nothing is really happening along the way. And then one day we have them and great, now we have them and we can solve certain hard problems that we couldn't solve before. It's not like that at all. All of the things uh, that we're doing scientifically are leading to other spin-off advances so uh, this is why I'm bullish about the field and why I think it's a fantastic investment for higher ed. Am I, am I answering the substance of your question, Andrew? Did yeah, you ab absolutely. Else? Yeah. And yeah, in fact, okay. I'm very and, sympathetic. Yeah, go ahead. I think, I think I'm done. <laughs> I'm at the risk of rambling. Yeah, yeah. Oh. No, that's okay. I'm very sympathetic to your comment about uh, von Neumann trying to uh, you know answer what a quantum what a classical computer could do. Yeah, that's you right. know sometimes I may I tell the story that you know the early applications of electronic computers were cryptography, like cracking German Enigma ciphers with the Bomba, and uh, doing simulations. Von Neumann used it to do nuclear simulations at you know Los Alamos and things, uh, you know, doing neutron diffusion simulations. And today, what we hear about quantum computers, the, the two applications people mention a lot, they'll mention cryptography. You know, everybody knows you could crack a code with a quantum computer uh, or simulation. You know, you could simulate chemistry or physics with them. Well, just as it was a narrow view for electronic computers to say that's all you could do with them, it's probably a very narrow view to think that's all you could do with a quantum computer as well. And what they'll end up ultimately doing, I think, is anybody these guess. It's, it's really hard to know at this point. And so that's why this broad-based education that we push here at UNM, we think will prepare students for the future. That's right. And, and just, okay, to, so, uh, hit, Shioni, just uh, to hit that last point home though, Andrew, like we continue to uh, add applications as we're developing these things. Like everybody that I know with a quantum education uh, can get job offers working uh, at the very least in a quantum adjacent field. It's an absolutely amazing investment for higher education. Anyway, thanks, sorry. <laughs> No, no, no problem. No, that's fine. Uh, so I want to pass the, the question next to uh, Shayoni. So Shayoni, could you share with us your thoughts of where you see uh, quantum information technology heading and what you think the role of uh, higher education uh, should be in that? So uh, it's very interesting where we are at right now. So that you see like incredible work uh, being done on uh, like trying to develop these different devices. There's also a lot of work that's going on on the here is side basically trying to understand what actually we can do this with this technology that we have. Um, and yet at the same time, we see like huge interest from industries outside of quantum uh, in quantum technologies right now. So um, we are at this very uh, like exciting stage where things are changing very fast 
and we might be in a rush to keep up with that. But I think it's also very important to be aware of the important and key developments that are happening in the field uh, and to filter out those ones from, uh, I wouldn't say noise, but let's say uh, to filter out the more important ones from the literature. Uh, so I think uh, universities have a very important role to play here, particularly in this direction. Uh, for example, like academia, academic institutions should definitely strive for ambitious goals. Like their research programs should have uh, uh, very like uh, uh, like a, like they should aim high to uh, answer some big questions, which usually uh, research institutes do or universities do. Uh, to encourage students to ask questions, uh, to um, be aware of the new techniques that are being developed in the field, and to also be uh, and to also encourage them to take courses. I think which is very useful, like particularly in say math department or computer science department, which becomes more helpful if it's done towards the beginning of. Uh, your uh, graduate program than towards like, for example, if I am interested in group theory, if I go back and I just read a book myself, uh, that is a much slower progress, I would think. Uh, maybe interacting with other students, uh, that helps a lot. For example, we had summer posts on group theory where one of our postdocs taught us. So it was uh, I think that was very helpful where someone is teaching you and it's more informal and you have students and postdocs who are talking to each other. So that uh, like uh, that helps a lot. Um, and then also encourage students to be uh, like, uh, like do internships in industries and to collaborate with uh, like, uh, like outside their own group. So these, I think, would uh, like so, so. So that would encourage them to not be uh, enclosed in their own circle, and also help like uh, increase their uh, or widen their horizon of knowledge. Uh, so there, I think universities. Oh, thank you, Shayoni. Would play a very important role. Thank you. So uh, the last question, so I'll pose the same question. The last, uh, uh, the last word is again by Travis on this. Um, I apologize, we're a couple of minutes over time here, but uh, I'm sure uh, Travis will leave us with some deep insights. So Travis, what are your thoughts about uh, technology development and quantum information and what you think the role of higher education uh, can be in that? Uh, that's very funny, deep insight, and I'm between you all in lunch. So I'm gonna go with concise insight. So, you know, one of the really interesting things, right, is that quantum technologies was dubbed one of the industries of the future by the US government over the past few years. And one of the cool things that I like about that is the fact that a lot of these technologies kind of can exist synergistically together. So for example, if we take quantum computing and quantum communications, right, we can build all of these standalone quantum computers that we want, maybe in principle, right? But we need to be able to network them together. And so in quantum communications is gonna tell us something about how to do that, how to build out these kind of data centers in a heterogeneous compute environment. With respect to universities and research, I think there's this tremendous opportunity now that we have these commercially available systems, you know, through the data centers, through cloud, et cetera, where you can play with them, right? Steve alluded to, you know, von Neumann's comments, right? Let's put these things on the cloud. Let's see what people do. Let's invent new applications. I think universities are a great place to be driving that forward. I think one concrete example of this, not an application per se, is actually the development of these ideas of quantum error mitigation, right? Ways of classically post-processing lots of different experiments that you run on quantum computers to kind of estimate like how would an ideal quantum computer behave. And that research thrust has really grown in recent years and is enabled by access to these systems over the cloud. Thank you, Andrew. Sure, thank you. And I uh, uh, appreciate your brevity as well. You know, <laughs> what is it? Brevity is the soul of wit or something like this. Exactly. Um, so uh, uh, let's thank all of our uh, members of the Alumni Showcase uh, for all their deep insights.
Okay. I'd like to also add my thanks, and you know, you think you're blushing uh, out there, uh, Travis, uh, you should see me there. I think we all see the amazing uh, alumni and students that we've uh, produced uh, here at the, in, the, in their collaborations at UNM. So I think, uh, Hannah, are there any words we want to add before we break for lunch? So yeah, Hannah, go for it. I'll be quick. Thank you all. Thanks again to our esteemed partners, moderators, presenters, panelists, and to you, our attendees. Some quick announcements for those interested. We are going to be gathering again at four o'clock today in this building and draft and table for a happy hour to continue our networking. At 1 p.m., for those who are joining the tours, we'll be meeting right outside these doors. So if you're gonna be joining one of the tours at 1 p.m., we'll depart from just outside this room. Um, tomorrow, the QNM symposium will continue virtually. So please do be sure to join us. There will be sessions focused on developing a quantum workforce and economy, and um, also fo a focus on quantum industry. So please do join us. If you haven't registered already, you can still RSVP through the link at qnm.unm.edu. And that is it. Please enjoy lunch. Thank you all for joining us.